It's worked so far, but we're not out yet. I want to know what you're thinking. There are some things you can't hide. I want to know what you're feeling. Tell me what's on your mind. Kaylee Frequencies Open, and welcome to Enterprising Individuals, the Star Trek discussion podcast that boldly goes into excruciating detail about the series, characters, and stories of the Star Trek universe. I'm your host, Aaron Coker, a.k.a. Caliban, and let's not lie to ourselves. Tom Paris isn't a pepperoni and Kavarian olives pizza guy. He's a Canadian bacon and pineapple pizza guy for sure. Joining me again on this episode is New York Times bestselling author Alan Gratz. Alan has written over a dozen historical and fantasy books for young readers. He's also the author of The Assassination Game, a Starfleet Academy young adult novel set in the Kelvin universe. His new novel, Grenade, comes out on October 9th and tells the story of a Japanese boy pressed into service in the Pacific Theater of World War II and his confrontation with a young American Marine on the island of Okinawa. Alan, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to have you back aboard. Today we'll be talking about Threshold, the 15th episode of the second season of Star Trek Voyager. There's no way to sugarcoat this. Threshold is a terrible episode of Star Trek. And it's easy to say that or to write it and simply relegate it to the Trek Hall of Shame that includes such dubious company as the Alternative Factor or Shades of Grey or Move Along Home. But the questions left unanswered by that statement are far more engaging. What makes it so bad? How could the genius minds behind Star Trek birth something so unsatisfying and frankly disgusting? How could a loving God let it happen? And (laughs) perhaps most importantly, what would make a grown man buy a mutant Tom Paris action figure on eBay? Science fiction is equal parts inspiring and ridiculous, with Trek being no exception, and it's too easy to dismiss something like Threshold as just bad. Trek fans, and let's face it, Trek writers and creators, would do well to study misfires like Threshold so they can better understand how something so sweet can turn so sour, and we'll talk about that a little later in the show. But first, Alan, Alan, what's Prison Break-In? Oh, man. Wow. You dug up. So you really went you really went (laughs) digging some stuff on IMDb there. Yes. Yeah. Prison break in. So. um, Right. So I've got some friends uh, who are filmmakers uh, and um, I've got a a good friend of mine that I went to grade school with and and then um, was a friend of mine all the way through college and still is one of my closest friends. uh, Did a a Sundance award winning short film and, and has gone on to do other film work. And it was through him that I got uh, sort of uh, co-opted into uh, writing at least a treatment for, a a synopsis for, um, a movie called Prison Mm -hmm. Break-In. Somebody had some money. Somebody wanted to make a movie. (laughs) Somebody had an idea. (laughs) Okay. They they needed a writer. And um, what does Alan Gratz do? He writes. So (laughs) I got roped in. Yeah, the the premise was uh, that uh, there's an older guy who um, is – uh, not able to afford his health insurance bills, uh, something that uh, as a writer, I, I can certainly uh, <laughs> identify with. Um, but uh, so he realizes that uh, if you happen to be in prison, you get free health care. So uh, he, uh, through a series of comic misadventures, attempts to get himself arrested uh, and thrown into jail so that he can be there to have the operation that he needs. Uh, wow. Yeah, sort of a, a sad commentary on American society, perhaps. Um, sure. <laughs> I, I, I was also asked to write the screenplay, but I demurred. Um, <laughs> um, I, I had books to write um, and, and um, saw the writing on the wall for Prison Break-In. I cannot, I cannot actually say that it is a good or bad movie. I have actually never seen the final product of okay. Prison Break-In. So, sure. um, so I, I, we'll have to save the... Um, the, uh, the the podcast where we tear it down the way we're going to do for threshold for another time, um, <laughs> but but it's one of the one of the things about being a writer is of course when when people need something written they they come they 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 come out of the walls at you. Yeah, sure. Well, it does. I mean, in the right hands, it sounds like a timely and poignant right. commentary on yeah American society. In between this and your work on City Confidential, is is this something that you I want I don't want to say aspire to, but look to maybe do in the future more yeah. screenwriting? Yeah, I would love to. Um, I just uh, sold the 
the option for the film rights to Refugee, which I'm very excited oh, about. Yeah, that's a that's a big deal for me. It's my first uh, real optioned uh, book for for screenplay. I will not be writing the screenplay for it. It's a complicated novel that was very hard for me to write because it was three different voices. Um, right. I can't imagine using that as my first attempt at writing a, a, a <laughs> screenplay. I'd right. rather write something that's a little bit more straightforward as my first attempt at that. So I was happy to have somebody uh, to hand that off to. Um, in fact, they've already uh, found somebody. They um, they have the person who wrote uh, Bridge of Spies on the line to, okay, to sure. write for it. Um, it. The way Hollywood goes, um, it'll probably go through 10 people before it gets written. But that's very exciting nonetheless. Um, and um, or if it ever gets written. Um, but yes, that is something I personally would love to do. I would love to write for television. Um, there was a time back in the day when I submitted Star Trek scripts. Uh, you know, TNG had an open door policy right. uh, when it was on television. And uh, a couple of college buddies and me got together for a few weekends in a row and knocked out a couple of scripts. Uh, never got any bites from them. But it's it's been a dream of mine, not just to write for Star Trek, but to write television or movies for a long time. Well, that's really exciting about Refugee. Congratulations Thanks. on Thanks. that. Uh, your recent release, Ban This Book, deals with censorship, but in the context of a fourth grader fighting against censorship in her school's library. Why did you want to write a story about censorship for young readers, and were there any real-life events that inspired the book? Yeah, you know, nobody's ever banned one of my books that I know of. and that's <laughs> Yet. What, yeah, they're right, or yet. Um, that's one of the things, though, that I talk about when I visit schools and talk about uh, book banning, is that the ALA figures that something like 90, I think their numbers are like, 98% of all book challenges in the U.S. go unreported. You know, books wow. disappear from shelves or the community doesn't get up in arms about it or what, what have you. And they only know about the ones that are reported. And there are still about 300 reported book challenges in the United States every year. So, you know, you do the math and, and if, if exponentially that, that, that works in the reverse, then and, – and their guesses about what are being, what's being unreported – all right, we're talking about thousands of book challenges every year in the United States, and I guess what I was trying to do with that one is to to give young readers the tools to be ready for something like that should it happen. Um, you know, you you never really need to worry about book censorship until you run into it, um, yeah. and uh, and also just reminding them that that book censorship is different than not liking a book. Uh, you can totally not like something, but it still remains on the shelf for everybody to read it. Um, yeah. And so there's a lot of stuff like that. Uh, I would never censor Threshold. Um, somebody <laughs> somebody out there might really want to watch this episode again. Um, <laughs> but uh, I would warn them not to. But, well, but yeah. <laughs> I, I certainly wouldn't keep them from doing it. Uh, my, my little Trek connection to ban this book is that one of the secondary characters in that book is a science fiction fan and a, and a Trek fan. And my, my Trek fandom bled through onto the pages even of oh, sure. about censorship. And uh, uh, he's, he's a Trek fan, but he's also dealing with some personal stuff that's happening with his family. And he's become very emotional and, and been prone to fighting and, 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 um, and, and arguing with people at school. And um, through the help of my main character, he's able to overcome some of that, to... to to um, sort of uh, ha have a, a moment where where he he has a breakthrough and, and he's able to move past some of his anger issues and he he comes to her and when he thanks her he, he says I'm I'm sorry that was uh, that was the mirror universe me that you were dealing with for <laughs> for a little while and sure <laughs> which the main character doesn't understand she's not me so she doesn't she's not a Trek fan um, so he gets to explain a little bit about you know about mirror Spock and 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 uh, the mirror episodes and. So I get a little bit of my fandom in there uh, on the page, which I had a lot, of, a lot of fun with. So a little Star Trek connection even to ban this book. That's really great. I've been uh, well, I've been casting a wide net uh, this week, getting ready for this episode, looking at other episodes of Trek. And I'm trying to th rack my brain and think about episodes that might have dealt with censorship. Yeah. And I'm not really coming up with anything. It yeah. just seems like Trek attacks so many social ills, it feels like censorship would be right up there. But I'm, off the top of my head, I, I can't really come up with anything. Yeah, nothing comes to mind. I'll have to I'll have to give that some thought, too. And um, maybe I can feed it to you for a supplemental if I can if I can think of anything. Please do. Yeah. 
Uh, I know that you're a Star Trek Discovery fan, and you've been a guest on Discovery, yeah. our Star Trek Discovery recap show. What do you think of the announcement of some new Trek series on CBS All Access, and specifically the return of Jean-Luc Picard? Right, so I'm very excited about that one. Uh, I mean, Picard is my favorite captain. We talked about that in the first episode I did with you mm-hmm. for, you know, Space Dads. And um, uh, I'm, I'm very excited. I think that Patrick Stewart, as, a, as an older man as an, uh, and a, as an older actor— has become even more interesting. Um, I, I really loved his role in Logan, um, and yeah. uh, I, I I'm really excited about the potential for well, for anything with Patrick Stewart in it. Period. But to get him back playing Picard, uh, I, I'm I'm very excited about that. As for other shows, um, you know, Star Trek fans like me have been begging for years to see. Star Trek do more with the world that it already has built. Um, yeah. I personally would love to see uh, a Starfleet medical show. I think that they could really kill it with a show that blend. I mean, half the shows on television right now are medical shows. So what if you take that medical show premise and you put them on a medical ship? You know, we saw in, I guess, what was it? All good things. Maybe where Beverly is the captain of her own right. medical ship. And I would be really interested to see a show centered around a ship whose mission is a medical one. And where we're still in the Star Trek universe, we're still having the same kind of of adventures that we do, but they're also being called in to deal with, 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 with issues on different planets or, um, you know, if it's, if there's a, I even thought it'd be cool to set it during the Dominion War to reap, to, to, to go, go back in time to the beginning of the Dominion War and then tell that story from the point of view of a medical ship would be really fascinating. Uh, yeah. So uh, like my, when they announced that my mind, my mind immediately went to like all the different shows I would make like, Oh wow. <laughs> you know, like we've never had a Starfleet Academy show. Um, that would yeah. be pretty incredible. Um, you know, we're lots of, op- the, the Star Trek galaxy universe has been, is, is so vast that there are really a lot of opportunities. The danger of course, is them spreading themselves too thin. We even saw it, when um, was there a year when we had TNG DS9 and Voyager on the air, or were they just TNG DS9 and then DS9 Voyager? I can't remember. That's the one. Yeah. Uh, so, they, so they weren't all three on at once, but they were there were two at a time. And they were working on films at the right, same time as well. Right. So you you could tell they were a little bit stretched. Then we've seen this with other properties, you know, like when Doctor Who went Torchwood and and the Sarah Jane stuff, you know, and they started to stretch and. That sort of thing. Sometimes I think that our favorite stuff can get stretched a little too thin. Um, yeah. But there's a lot of creative people out there, and if they if they bring on the right, I, I liked Angel. Uh, I liked Angel just as much as Buffy, and I thought that it worked really great in tandem with it. And so I um, I, I do think that that when done well, when you can hand it off to a really strong team and say go thou and and make something great in this world, um, <laughs> you know, then there's a lot of potential. So. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Cautiously optimistic. <laughs> yeah. And we're definitely going to talk about uh, productions overextending themselves mm-hmm. uh, in this episode as we talk about a threshold. I like your Starfleet medical pitch. Um, and when you watch, uh, you know, I have a few like doctor friends and friends who are in yeah. the medical industry. And from what I gather, uh, TV medical dramas are as much fiction <laughs> often as Star Trek is. Sure. So or legal dramas. You could dramas. definitely – I hear from legal, from legal lawyers, dramas too. The legal dramas are all completely fiction too. I mean it, it, it's all drama. Uh, and so um, that gives me hope that I could actually write a medical drama even though I know nothing about medicine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you got to save the Dominion War arc for sweeps though. That's – Oh, right. 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 So we can pull that in. <laughs> we'll put it in for sweeps. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I – I, I, let, let's do it. We, let's get you and me together and pitch that medical one and, and, and get us a show on CBS okay. All Access. Now I got to, I have to delete this part now. So <laughs> no one here, here's it. Cause we don't want to give away our golden egg. Yeah, right. <laughs> personally, I'm most fascinated by the development of the short Trek films. To me, that's the most radical thing that they're trying. It's, it's one thing to do just another hourly show. That's Trek's bread and butter. And even when they're <clears throat> set in the past or they're bringing back old characters, you're kind of doing the same thing. But there's never been anything like a, a 10 to 15 minute film produced for Trek before. Or if you count all the fan films that have been produced. And this feels very much like they're finally cluing in. Well, two things. It feels like they're cluing into the fan films that have been done in a shorter format, a shorter format which they force them into by limiting the number yeah. of minutes they could film. And right. um, but also, uh, they're online. 
they, they don't have to stick to an hour-long format. There's no guarantee that any of these are ever going to end up on any kind of broadcast television or cable television with regular commercial breaks in it. Um, you know, we've got the Netflix shows, the Netflix original stuff uh, to use as examples where they're still making them about an hour long because that's just where TV got itself to, TV writing got itself to. But yeah. why not? You know, we see in cartoons, some, some great cartoons have a half an hour block, but they do two short pieces within it. Um, right. if they can get in and out and do a quick, fun story in 10 or 15 minutes, I'd love it. And why not? They have, they have no time slots to fill on uh, within a regular schedule. Right. And sometimes that leads to a 35 minute episode of discovery on CBS all access, right. but, <laughs> but other times it yeah. leads to a 50 or a 55 minute one. So, right. Yeah. And unfortunately the, 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 the other side of that double edged sword though, is that um, one of the things that we're running into with Netflix, at least it's my opinion that a lot of the Netflix original shows suffer from not having any constraints on them. Um, you know, television really worked broadcast and, and then, and then cable television, but anything that was, that was, that was piped into your home and had commercials and had an hour long or half hour long block to work with, they had constraints on them and you had to get to certain beats in the story by a certain time. And you had advertisers who would walk away and you had viewers who would walk away and, yeah. And with those constraints, it forced, I think, TV writers to become better and better and better. I, we're living in a, in a real golden age of television right now. And, um, but I worry that, that, that going to a streaming service of any kind where there are no rules and you can go short or long and you don't have to hit the beats or you can do 13 episodes in a season and not get to the, you know, not get to the real story until episode four, you're going to start really losing all the, all the strong thing points that that all those constraints gave us, you know, all all the strengths the, of television writing will go out the window. So they just have to be careful that that the that the no rules doesn't lead to no, like a lower quality product. Yeah, the amount that's available or the amount that is commissioned, I think, affects it a lot as well. Yeah. If you watch a lot of these um, Netflix like Marvel shows and they're doing ten or twelve episodes, I feel like. They came up with an idea that could last for about five or five six, or six episodes, yes. like a first season arc, yep. and then they have to pad it all out, whereas Discovery was lucky enough to get that order of 15 episodes so they could give you sort of the traditional 15 to 16 episodes that you'd get on a, a traditional TV uh, season, and then if you're really good, you get the pickup of like the back eight or nine. Right. Um, but you see like these streaming shows, definitely on Netflix yeah. in particular, sort of struggle with trying to fill out the rest of the time. Yeah, that, that's exactly – the Marvel ones were exactly what I had in mind. Um, you know, I, I, they, they just drag sometimes. And yeah. um, uh, I, I also I also have to admit that um, – and I think we talked a little bit about this on Discoverage last season, but – um, I think sometime, I think that the short films might also be another way to just keep reeling in our $7 a month or whatever it is that they charge for All Access. I currently am not subscribed to CBS All Access. I will resubscribe when the new Star Trek content comes on, and I think they know it, and I think a lot of people do the same thing. And I think yeah. that the short films are another way of saying, wait, 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 we've got more content for you. Um, and so I'm, they're going to reel me in for another month or two that I wouldn't have paid for um, to get access to these things. And I'll do it because I enjoy Star Trek and I enjoy Discovery. Sure. Um, yeah. but, I, but I also think it's kind of a play for, for keeping us year-round subscribers as well. Yeah. To that end, maybe they should have even more. I mean, if they can right. afford it right. and if they have time in their schedule. Because when you think about it, 10 to 15 minutes – that's the length of or shorter than a lot of YouTube videos. Yeah. Like when I sit down to watch YouTube, I'm watching videos that are longer than that. Yes. And so I think that this is a great chance for them to, like you said, give you a little a hit of Trek uh, that isn't necessarily a full episode. But yeah, if, if they want that to be their strategy, they probably should have more than four. We're going to have more of them. But it's a start. So let's see yeah. how they do. Maybe if they do, you know, they put out the four in one month or over two months, probably something like that. I don't know if we've yeah. announced the schedule, but, you know, if they put them out and it does bring viewers back, maybe that will, with the more money in the coffers, the, they'll, they'll say, let's, let's produce some more of these. And heck, if they're giving, if they're giving, you know, if they're going to make a whole bunch of new shows, then they could at least have a team of people out there making shorts from the, from, from Discovery and the new shows all the time. It'd be great. Yeah. And I, I also think that they're sort of uh, 
trial it's a trial for uh, yeah. possible spinoffs as well sure. i know that there's been talk about a possible giorgio spinoff and a mud spinoff and a short like this and being able to gauge its popularity is a good way to judge whether a character could support their own show. oh that's interesting it's also a good trial balloon for some writers uh and and possibly some some directors i don't know if they're bringing in new directors but um you know, we, we, Michael Chabon is going to write one of the episodes, and he's not yeah. typically a television writer. So it, it also gives an opportunity to do some stunt casting, as it were, for the writer and director. If you, you know, so <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe Quentin Tarantino could cut his chops on a discovery, <laughs> a discovery short film first before they give him the reins to the uh, to the theatrical release. I, I find the Michael Chabon thing so fascinating. Yeah. Um, I think I've said this on a previous show, but I love the fact that he's got a Pulitzer Prize and he's just like <laughs> lauded as an author far and wide. But what he really wants to do is sit in a writer's room and drink bad coffee yeah. and argue with 25 year olds. Yeah. Uh, about work, about the Warp 10, which we're going to argue. <laughs> here yeah, well, thanks for bringing us back to it. I don't think we can, <laughs> I don't think we can avoid it anymore. And I guess this question answers itself, but why did you choose this specific episode to discuss today? Or more accurately, why did you let me talk you into talking right. about this? Episode well, I, I was going to say, why did you force me to rewatch this? <laughs> episode right so we're both blaming each other this is good to start so um okay threshold um so i thought a lot about this like why threshold i mean obviously we're we're talking about it because it's so bad and um uh you know friends romulans countrymen lend me your ears i come to bury threshold not to praise it um though unlike (laughs) unlike mark anthony i actually mean it this time you really mean it it. (laughs) and um so i i do own uh, one Voyager action figure. It is the mutated Tom Paris with the three space salamander babies. It is the only Voyager action figure I own. And I did not purchase it from eBay. Oh, no. I purchased it in a toy store during Voyager's run. <laughs> okay. I watched this episode the first time it came out. And I, I think it might be the episode where I stopped watching Voyager. Mm-hmm. Um, I did stop watching Voyager and only came back to it when it was on Netflix. Uh, by the way, I was going to bring this up later, but in one of your supplemental episodes, you reported that uh, of all the Star Trek shows on Netflix, surprisingly, the one that was watched the most was Voyager. That's right. And I have a theory about that. And my theory <laughs> is... Exactly what happened to me. My theory is that a lot of us started watching it and bailed on it when it was on television the first time. And then when Netflix streaming cam- comes along 10, 15 years later, I don't know how long it's been, like, then we're like, oh, you know, I never finished, wa- I never watched all of the Voyagers and I love Trek. I need me some right. Trek. And so it was like new Trek content. And my feeling is that one of the reasons it's probably the most watched on, Vo- on Netflix is because none of us watched it the first time and we all went back to watch it this time. So right. I think that this episode, I really do think this episode was the one that broke me, that said, <laughs> that, that I'm done with Voyager. I cannot watch this anymore. I have always remembered it as when people say, what's the worst episode of any Star Trek show ever? It's the first word out of my mouth. Although, hmm. as you, you pointed out, there are other really strong contenders. Um yes. I think Shades of Grey is, now that with some distance, the worst episode of any Star Trek ever. But they weren't trying, right? Like, it was an episode done because the writers were on strike and they had to finish yeah. an episode for the last one of the season. So they cranked it out. This yeah, is it's an like episode, an incomplete. It's not an F. It's an incomplete. That, that, that's good. That's a good way of saying it. That's right. It's an incomplete. Yeah. Like, Threshold was an actual attempt at entertaining television. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's chilling <laughs> right, I'm just going to put that out there right now um, and it is an abject failure on every level and and I think that that's one of the reasons I still hold it up as worse than Shades of Grey if, if, you, had, if you said for the rest of your life you could only watch one episode it's going to be either Shades of Grey or it's going to be Threshold I would probably pick Threshold because they're at least trying but, okay. but I still think it's a really really bad episode right up there with um Oh, a code of honor. T- yeah. Oh, that's a terrible episode. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Sub Rosa, also. Oh yeah. Also written by today's author. Um, oh, we're gonna get into that. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> We've got that's all. That's Quite all in our future. Yeah. 
so I think that my my yeah. experience was very similar yeah. to yours, uh, almost identical in that this is where I pulled the ripcord yeah. as well. But I really I really meant what I said in the opening. Like I believe in Trek enough that I don't want to fully shrink from the bad episodes. Sure. I think they're all part of the package. Yes. It's sort of like you know if you want me at my best of both worlds, you have to take me at my threshold. <laughs> And TV writing can be so tough. You have to satisfy so many people. You have to yeah. do it week after week. You have so little lead time often. Right. And you're dealing with aliens and technobabble and these tough themes. I'm amazed that more Trek episodes don't turn out like Threshold. To be honest, it's, it's a fair comment. And, and you know, I, I've been re-watching uh, everything from, from, from TOS on up with my teenage daughter. She's watched them all before with us when she was much younger, but now... We're rewatching them and laughing about the bad ones and, and talking about what we love about the good ones. But we don't skip the bad ones, just as you said. And, sure. and I feel like you, you take the good with the bad. And, um, you know, we, we'll, we suffered through Shades of Grey. Um, and and we, we, when we get to Voyager eventually, um, if, if we rewatch Voyager, we will, we will suffer through, <laughs> through Threshold as well. Um, I. I think for because that one is because it's so memorable because it broke me the first time, um, and then I realized after I made the foolish um, before I foolishly agreed to do this when I went on Netflix to rewatch this episode. I own TNG and DS9 on DVD. I do not own Voyager on DVD. So I went on to Netflix to rewatch this, and when I went to the season list, the only episode with a full red bar underneath it that I have watched before and recently was threshold and <laughs> I, I realized that to my horror i have probably seen this episode of voyager more than any other episode of voyager ever wow yeah um, i think that says a lot now there are definitely other episodes of tng and the original series and ds9 that i've watched more than threshold but i had this is the one episode of voyager i have watched the most um, and uh, maybe this will be the last time. I don't. I doubt it. <laughs> it's not much of an epitaph for the show. <laughs> that threshold is the one that you keep coming back to. <laughs> um, before we uh, wade yes. neck deep into this, I guess I should say that we are, of course, talking about the Voyager episode Threshold, the fifteenth episode of the second season of the show. It first aired on January twenty ninth of nineteen ninety six. The teleplay is by Brandon Braga, who, of course, is an executive producer on Voyager and effectively the head writer on the show. And, of course, he worked on Next Gen. Uh, he helped develop Enterprise. Right, He's a co-creator of Enterprise yeah. and some of the TNG films as well. The story is by Michael DeLuca. And I want to save this one. We're going to talk yeah. about Mr. Yeah, DeLuca yeah. in just a little bit. And it's directed by Alexander Singer, who's, of course, a veteran director. He helmed a combined 22 episodes yeah. of TNG, DS9, and Voyager. And Threshold, was, was this is his second episode of Voyager. Uh, the first was Tattoo. Uh, the star rate for the episode is 49373.4, and you know the drill. Your assignment, if you can, is to give us a 25-word synopsis of Threshold, and no pressure, but your last time on the program, you became the first guest to deliver a synopsis in exactly 25 words. I can do it again if you will give me permission to count Fishman as one word. If it's hyphenated, yeah, you can do it. Yeah, I did. I hyphenated it. All right. Okay. Here we go. Tom Paris breaks the warp 10 barrier, evolves into a Fishman and kidnaps Captain Janeway. They become four-foot-long salamanders and have salamander babies together. <laughs> okay. That is, that is my 25 exactly, exactly 25-word synopsis of this episode. That's not just, yeah, that's not just a, a pitch. That's a full-on synopsis. Thank you. Um, mine was, uh, and it also has a hy uh, hyphenated That's word. fine. Oh, uh, after breaking the Warp 10 barrier, Tom Paris finds himself undergoing a process of hyper-evolution, and the Doctor must race to save his shipmate's life. Oh, well, see, yeah, yeah I, I, I had... That one leaves a little mystery. My, yeah, my first draft, I had something about the forced evolution. I, I have evolved here, but I, uh, hopefully you heard my air quotes around <laughs> yes. evolved. Uh, something yes. else we'll hopefully discuss. And, um, but uh, I, I had this longer thing about, you know, the first, first time I try to write one of these, it's like 85 words long. And then I'm like, great, I, <laughs> I have to cut like, a, you know, three fourths of this out. Um, so I tried to stick to the high points, work 10, fish man, kidnap, yeah. salamander babies. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, you know, Hot spots. that that's the, that's how you get somebody to watch this episode. To right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other one I came up with was just the word crap 25 times. <laughs> Yeah, that that would also be a good summary. Here are some interesting facts from the memory banks about this episode. When breaking the episode, the writers asked themselves what would happen if they broke one of the 
fundamental rules of Star Trek mm. in this case that you can't travel faster than warp 10. Yeah. Uh, it's like light speed for light speed. Uh, the element of Paris transforming as a result of his flight was later added. Braga said in an interview years later that Paris's transformation was an homage to David Cronenberg's The Fly. Yeah, it's I think pretty he's disgusting, like The Fly. In the episode, yep. Yeah. Uh, the actual rational- rationalization behind the evolutionary transformation was cut from the episode ultimately. Yeah. But the idea was that uh, it was a challenge to the common trope that evolved humans would be bald floating alien types uh, and they might instead regress to something more rudimentary uh, in a cyclical process of evolution yeah the explanation still doesn't help uh, no. uh but but yeah without it it's just it's so weird it tells you kind of it kind of tells you why they're leaning so hard into where they end up right and the, like why would they go that far there's a little it? bit of it left i i read t- i also read that some speech at the end was cut or some dialogue at the end was cut that yeah. explained that um, there's a little bit of it left in some stuff that the doctor says, uh, I think when talking with Chakotay and, and Tuvok, um, about, um, you know, he, he talks about, you know, how millions of years of human evolution have led us to this point. Um, we've gotten, you know, bigger brains and, 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 and all that and stuff. Uh, but perhaps he says what we're seeing is, uh, you know, if, if humanity, went uh, a different direction and you feel like there's more to it than that 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 got cut uh, at some point yeah. but you he's hinting at at the direction yeah yeah uh, the process of applying the mutant prosthetics to Robert Duncan McNeil took over five hours. However, as the prosthetics weren't intended for reuse, like with the other alien members of the crew, like Taurus or Neelix, McNeil could just rip them off at the end of the shooting day. Uh, the episode is something of a bottle episode in that it features no guest stars and mainly existing sets. However, VFX were required to bring the hyper-evolved Paris and Janeway and their offspring to life. Two full-sized models of the amphibious creatures were made, and they were operated by little-person actresses Susan Rosito and Cindy Sorensen. So I'm going to treat them as the guests, yeah, let's uh, guest do that. stars sure. for this episode. They're just stars uh, Rosito... the episode. Guest stars. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. The breakout stars. <laughs> uh, Rosito was a stunt woman and actress who appeared on TV many times, as well as in features like Batman Returns, Liar Liar, and Leprechaun. And she played the nurse in Eminem's vid- video for The Real Slim Shady. And Sorensen is an actress who has worked in film and television and has appeared on both TNG and DS9 in addition to Voyager. She was also in the 1986 short film Captain EO. Oh, Kids, wow. ask your parents. Yeah, I, I could tell you all about that. It was great. <laughs> it was the only reason to go to Epcot. So, right. Um, yeah, uh, this also, and I'm not sure you just said it, uh, won an Emmy. This episode won an Emmy. It did win an Emmy for uh, outstanding makeup for a series, and it beat out the DS9 episode Visitor right. that year, which is, if you have to put a, if you have a scale or some kind of diagram of good Trek episodes versus bad ones, I think Visitor is very high up on the scale. Right. And of course, Threshold is very, <laughs> very low, low down, down on the scale. Um, to be fair, the Emmy that it won was, uh, as you say, for makeup and, and special effects. And if there's one thing that is featured again and again in this episode from about the 20 minute mark on, it's a whole lot of, of makeup and special effects. I mean, mm-hmm. every scene, Tom Paris has evolved in something new and different. And um, though it's grotesque, it's effective. It's gro- it makes you sick looking at it. And I think that was right. probably the, 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 the point. And so um, it, it's deserving for that win. I, I think I looked it up. I think over, its, uh, li- over the seven seasons, it wasn't it seven seasons for Voyager as well, um, that right. they had six Emmy wins. And this is one of the six. So uh, without Threshold, they'd be down in any. Uh, This episode also uh, succeeded in the Nielsen ratings. Uh, It had a rating of 6.2 million homes with a 9% share and was the third most watched episode of Voyager's second season. But critics weren't as kind (laughs) as the Nielsen's uh, or the Emmy uh, voters. Cinefantastique magazine gave the episode one out of four stars. Star Trek Monthly magazine gave it one out of five stars. Uh, it has a 5.2 rating on IMDb, and former guests of the show Terry Erdman and Paula Block gave this episode a Spock's Brain Award oh, yeah. in their Star Trek 101 book, saying the episode was, quote, most likely to give Darwin a migraine. Yeah. Now, I love Spock's Brain, so I assume that they're just saying <laughs> that it's inventive and whimsical. Is that what they're saying? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, uh, zombies. This... That's all of, yeah. 
<laughs> yes. This episode also features the rare running plot line uh, of crewman Michael yeah. Jones being played by Raphael Sabarge, sending a secret message to the Kazon. Remember, yeah. remember that? I remember I, I was like, oh, right, the Kazon and that that guy. So it's so bizarre to, to go back and watch an episode uh, just pulling it out of continuity and then realizing yes. like there's a scene earlier on before he contacts the Kazon where he's looking over his shoulder at, right. at Bellana and, and, and Kim, you know, and like he's taking more of an interest than the regulars or than the, than the, yeah, who is this extra? The extras yeah. are supposed <laughs> to take, you know, and you're like, yeah. what? Turn around. You're not supposed to be looking at the camera. And <laughs> right. then you realize, oh, it's the, the payoff is that he's that he's feeding information about warp 10 technology to the Kazon. Can you are you able to remind me why in the world this chucklehead thinks it's a good idea to spy on Voyager for the Kazon? If you look at my next Netflix queue, uh, it's the same as yours. Okay. I think there's one red bar on yeah. your threshold. Yeah, and that's about it. But I believe it has to do with. Uh, the defection of Seska in the oh, first season right. to the Kazons. Okay. And so he, he's thinking he can hook up uh, with them and with Seska okay. and get something out of that. Right. Right. Yeah, it's it's not great. And honestly, I think that the lack of serialization or at least the constant wars over serialization uh, in the Trek franchise helped lead to its, you know, its first or second demise, right. I guess you'd say. Second, but yeah. looking back 20 years on, I kind of think that Rick Berman might have had a point because when I watch this episode, I'm like, who is this guy again? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm all for uh, continuity. I'm all for seeing things pop up again. You know, every time that 30 Rock makes a reference to something three seasons ago, I'm like, <laughs> right. oh, my God, that they're, you know, it's, you know, werewolf bar mitzvah again. And, and so, like, right. I love that stuff. But it does mean that you have to be an uber fan of the show. Like, to get this is more than just a this is more than just a funny reference to a funny thing that happened before this is a plot right. point in the yes show. and so yeah. yeah i agree with you like i i'm all for continuity and yet i'm watching this episode and i'm like oh man we totally don't need that in here um so that yeah doing an entire setup with a whole nother scene and a whole nother actor is way different than you know just tracy referring to his mind groups or something <laughs> right. like that exactly yes yeah. Yeah. So no, it, it was a weird moment, and I was like, "Oh, yeah, I, I'd forgotten that we had his file." Though, to be fair, Voyager needed some kind of conflict, and they they quickly did away, unfortunately, with the conflict between the Maquis crew members and the Starfleet crew crew members. Um, yeah. The only episode I remember at all of Voyager, I, I, that's not true. I remember a few, but one of the ones that, that stands out to me wasn't there one where there's a where there's like a holodeck novel that people are passing around that's all about a mutiny. Like somebody on the crew, it's all about the, the people on the ship as fictional. They, they are the characters in the novel, and there's a plot to overthrow Janeway and put Chakotay in as captain. And people are playing through the novel in the holodeck, and it starts making people think about, like, maybe, are, are, are we happy with what's going on here? And it's like the... It's like the writers took what should have been seasons worth of conflict between the two crews and put it in the fictional environment of the holodeck and hit the reset button at the end, which, of course, we're going to get to at this as well. But the yes, the reset button is right next to the build new shuttle. Yeah, button on yeah, Voyager. yeah. The build new shuttle button um, and, and the clean up the outside of Voyager from the space battle button is right there, too. too. Um, <laughs> right. You know, and so uh, but I, I, anyway, I. I, not to give too much time to this guy and his little spy subplot, but <laughs> but but it, the show needed something, and, and it was yeah. too little though. It was too little, and 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 in retrospect now, just totally meaningless. It's such a fascinating idea, one that you could even use on another show. Right. I mean, it's f suited to Voyager because of you know the aspect of mutiny, but it's got the holodeck, and it's I love episodes that dig into like the the social implications of of the holodeck. Yes. But yeah, I mean, three at the end of the third season, it's it's kind of too late to do yes. that at that point. And, it, and it's done in one together. episode. It, it's not carried through. Yeah. It's you know, it, it's not it's not something that's boiling under the surface. Um, it, yeah. It's all it, it's all generated just during that episode. You know, it, it's like Chicote suddenly becoming a boxer for an episode and then going <laughs> um, just <laughs> an example uh, out of a hat. You know? Yeah, sure, just totally <laughs> randomly. Just totally made uh, that up off the cuff. <laughs> 
So. Uh, there's a there's an episode uh, that we actually covered previously on this season uh, that takes place relatively early in the first season of Voyager called Prime Factors, and it's in the episode uh, they meet this race that has a technology that could like teleport them right. home or at least close to home, and basically they don't want to share it. And Janeway says, "All right, well if you're not going to give it to us, I guess we can't have it." And Taurus immediately sets off this plan to like basically steal yeah. it, and a bunch of like. From a key crew members immediately jump up and go, we'll help you with that. Yeah, right. And I thought that that was a great way to show that the loyalty was not completely cemented and yeah. that these people were ready, not only as people who worked with Torres, but also as, I guess, just revolutionary type right. people who work with the McKee. Yeah. Um, but that's a first season episode. Yeah. And, 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 and after that, it seems like after the first season, they just absolutely let that go. And they were just going to be Star Trek from there on out. Uh, I mean, there was only lip service maybe occasionally paid to the differences between the two crews. In this one, we do get Tom Paris when he's when he's crazy pants and 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 being affected by the forced evolution. And he's yelling at Janeway through the the bio uh, field. Um, He says something about like, I'll always just be some Maquis guy that you picked up that you don't trust. Uh, and yeah. I'm like, whoa, where did that come from? Like, like that's <laughs> that's first season stuff, man. Get, get out of here. That. Yeah, <laughs> that's in the character bible for this character. Right, yeah, so we're we're di- yeah, I guess along with the p- his pizza topping choices, <laughs> and and when and where uh, he lost his virginity, which is a oh jeez. <laughs> so like, just I, I don't I'm getting ahead of myself, but that moment that's fine. where he starts babbling, I understand they're trying to write some sort of stream of consciousness babbling. But when he yeah. starts talking about losing his virginity, and then as he's dying the first time, says like, "Kiss, come here, give me a little sugar," you know, like there's this is really uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is this is one of those moments where you're like, "Oh, I'm I'm glad I'm I'm not a doctor." <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, although, of course, the LMH maintains his uh, his composure, or the EMH throughout the he, entire he's, thing. He's the only. Yeah, the EMH is the only one with the good lines in this one. He, the, yeah, right. Spock yeah. has a good line later on, but he, but the Doctor definitely got some good writing this episode. As you mentioned earlier, Playmates Toys had made a figure yes. for this episode. Um, they made hundreds of figures yeah. for various Star Trek properties, but only two official <laughs> runs of Voyager figures. <laughs> And they ended after the second season. They did uh, release sporadic Voyager figures that were episode specific. And most of those were, unsurprisingly, Seven of Nine figures. But, of course, one in particular was Mutant Tom Paris, released in 1997. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Uh, He has held a a place of honor in my Star Trek action figure collection among my literally dozens of TNG and TOS and Deep Space Nine figures. The only only Voyager one I own is this one. because of the ridiculousness of the episode, and then the doubly ridiculous like factor that, that that playmates made an action figure out of it, like yes, what kind of demand? Well, it was as you said, the third most watched episode of the season. Maybe they just yeah. said, we, you know, where where can we go? Or maybe they were just looking for something that didn't look like the regular crew member. How many times can you put uh, Picard in a you know a, a Dixon Hill outfit? You know, so I mean, right? So. You've got two Vicks, you've got Jane away in a Victorian dress, right. uh, yeah. you know, you've got uh, pre-Borg, Seven of Nine, and you've got Mutant Tom. Right, Pia. so how many variations can you do on these guys? Poor Kim, I don't think he changes his clothes once in seven years. <laughs> um, no. So uh, I, I own that one, and I usually pose him, because of course I, I took him out of the blister pack. I'm not, this, is, I, this isn't for, I'm never selling him. I would never deign to resell my mutant Tom Paris. He's he's posed on top of the, the the box with the rest of them, and he he holds lovingly one of his mutant salamander space babies, um, oh, which he does not do in the episode. No, <laughs> no, fact, they just were running. He needs them. two accessories. <laughs> So what is it going to be? <laughs> we've got a phaser and we've got maybe his tongue. Mm, too dark. Uh, his babies. He could feed his tongue to the babies. Um, <laughs> oh, because at one point in the horror show that is the sick bay scene, the, uh, the never ending sick bay scene, he pulls his tongue out of his full tongue out of his mouth and turns and smiles at us. Like, yeah, and, but this this does not stop him from talking no, in the next I act. No, I was like, though. oh my god, thank goodness he's going to stop talking. And then I remember he <laughs> does not stop talking. It just becomes no. even more horrific when he's babbling. Um, yeah. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. 
Well, two more yeah. notes. Uh, the episode marks the debut of the Class 2 shuttlecraft on the series. That's the real skinny uh, Arrowhead one. one. I think it's a well-designed shuttlecraft. Yeah, it's kind of cool. And finally, I don't know if you remember, but in February of this year, a story was making the rounds uh, of the nerd internet that a scientific researcher by the name of Lewis Zimmerman <laughs> had written a paper entitled Rapid Genetic and Developmental Morphological Change Following Extreme Celerity. And the paper was published in a scientific journal. Of course, Lewis Zimmerman is not a real the person. creator of the He's EMH. He's a researcher yeah. who created the EMH right. and was developing the LMH. And the paper described in specific detail how the process of going warp 10 <laughs> would cause morphogenic hyperevolution in biological creatures. Well, in reality, the paper was written by a <clears throat> researcher uh, who did not give his real name. Uh, his pseudonym is Biotrecki. <laughs> He's a research scientist, and he wrote the paper and submitted it to 10 open access scientific journals in an effort to expose their lack of peer review. And it worked. This was done. It did work. Uh, this was done uh, last or the year before in 2017 by somebody uh, writing a paper about midichlorians. Right. All right. And the paper was accepted by four out of the 10 journals, and it was actually published by one, yeah. the American Research Journal of Biosciences, for a $50, $50 fee. Yeah, this is I, – I love these stories, the midichlorian one from last year and this one from this year. I, I did know about that, and um, I love that these guys are trying to expose these these charlatan – you know, the, the, the whole business of publish or perish in, in the university system – I'm not a professor, but uh, I, I have friends who are, and I know mm -hmm. the immense pressure on them to publish and, um, and, and, and to have a paper – Accepted to a peer-reviewed journal can take a long time and and can be rejected. And if your career, uh, if your you know if your tenure, your career is based on how many articles you've published and and things you've done per year, that then of course there was going to be sort of a uh, black market's not the right word, but a but a, a a pay pay to publish system popped up to get people published and to get those credits on their resumes. And I love that people are taking them down. Not only taking them down, but using, but using terrible science fiction. Uh, you know, like the midichlorians are are arguably just as bad as breaking the warp ten barrier. I mean, probably worse. But the but but taking bad things from science fiction and then and then writing bad fraudulent papers with them is genius. Yeah, it's sort of like a um, academic Banksy kind yes, of thing. Yes, yes, <laughs> I know? love it. Yeah. <laughs> And it's supposed to be peer reviewed, but of course, yeah. you know, he has little blurbs in there like we thank the UFP for financial support <laughs> and they want to thank uh, B. Braga for helpful insights. Nice. So it's not like you didn't have a chance to figure yeah. this out. But, well, I mean, yeah. and if you just if you just you pull out a thesaurus and, 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 you know, broke down what he was actually saying, I mean, like, like, what is he even talking about with Warp 10? I mean, like, so clearly right. nobody's reading these, you know, and, and especially from the place that, that did publish it. Um, so I, yeah. I love it. Um, maybe, maybe we'll see one next year about uh, spore drives. <laughs> <laughs> we can only hope. Because I would love well, them uh, to explain that in a peer reviewed paper. But yeah, yeah I, I think somebody probably already has. I've seen a lot of think pieces about like why the real Paul Stamets, you know, has is he's onto something here. Right, right. Uh, well, let's talk about the yes. episode and what went so wrong. Um, I, I, to do that, I think we have to start with the story of Michael DeLuca that yes. I promised before. Yeah. And it, it's tied into the story of New Line Cinema. Uh, Michael DeLuca is a Hollywood producer. And he got to start at New Line Cinema. He went from an intern all the way to the president of New Line in just seven years, which is a Hudsuckerian rise. Wow, very certainly. good. Yeah, I like that. Um, at New Line, he was um, an executive producer, and he produced many of the good and bad films that defined the 90s and early 2000s, uh, such as The Mask, uh, Don Juan DeMarco, Boogie Nights, Wag the Dog, Dark City, Blade, yeah. Austin Powers, wow. uh, all films that everyone knows. Um, and the returns dried up eventually, and New Line let him go. Then he started his own production company and went into business with Sony, uh, but the late 2000s were slow. Uh, he produced Ghost Rider and The Love Guru, Ooh. so not a lot yeah. going on there, yeah. Uh, then in 2010, he helped produce a little film called The Social Network. Yeah. Uh, the Social Network was, of course, nominated for Best Picture. And so that meant that 2011 was a big year for him. He produced seven films that year, including Moneyball, which was also nominated for a Best Picture yeah. in 2011. But he also produced Drive Angry, Priest, Butter, and Ghost Rider 2, Spirits of Vengeance. Yeah. So consistency is not a factor <laughs> here. After that, it was a little bit sporadic in terms of what he was producing, but he did produce or help produce Captain Phillips in 2013, which, of course, was also nominated for an Academy Award for Best Picture. Yeah. 
And after that, he produced uh, Dracula Untold and all three Fifty Shades films. Oh, yeah. So again, a fluctuation in the quality of content. Yep. These days, he's producing the Academy Awards. Uh, he also produced uh, the Oscars' lowest-rated 2017 <laughs> ceremony, which featured the La La Land Moonlight screw-up. Oh, yeah. And he has half a dozen more projects in development, one of which is Suicide Squad 2. Oh, help us, please. So the big story is, yes, the threshold <laughs> of uh, comic book movies. Yeah. <laughs> so the the story, or the question is, how did he come to write the story for Threshold? And I don't know the answer. So, you know, he was the head of New Line in 95, and as far as I can figure, he must have met Braga at Spago or I something? I don't know. But, and one part of, so the only thing that I knew about, you, you uncovered way more about him than, than I found out about him. I, I, I admittedly didn't go digging very far, but... But I had read that he had also been producing um, a lot of horror movies. Um, yes. And so. Which was New Lines Bread right, and Butter right. in the I mean, very right, early days. Uh, Freddy Krueger. I mean, House of Freddy Krueger, right? I mean, isn't New mm. Line uh, Nightmare on Elm Street? Like, wasn't that like their big. I, I, thought, yeah. I thought that was their big. The house that Wes Craven built. Yeah, yeah right. So um, I, my feeling was, I don't know how he got, I don't know how he got connected to Voyager. But it seemed like at that time in his professional life as a writer slash producer that he was into horror. And this this episode for a good 20 minute chunk in the middle of it is a horror story. I mean, it is it is the fly. Um, it, it is it is the, tran- the the slow and painful transformation of a character into a hideous monster. And they even talk about it in the episode, you know, like. Um, you know, Janeway says, you know, how are you feeling? He's like, well, I'm okay. And she's like, well, you've looked better. And you know, the, 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 the makeup, uh, is, um, uh, is as much a character in this episode as any of the players. And, uh, I, I just wonder if he came in and he said, what if you did a horror story where a guy, you know, transforms into like evolves into some kind of monster and, I don't know how much more he was involved with it. I don't know if, like, did he know enough about Trek to say, like, he breaks the Warp 10 barrier? Is that something Braga brought to it? I don't know. Possibly. I know that he is a self-described geek okay. and was a Trekkie um, from back in the oh, day. Well, maybe- and early in his career, he was a screenwriter as well. Now, on something like, you know, Freddy's Dead <laughs> or... <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street 10, I'm not sure how much you're a writer or just somebody who's like, um, put blood here. Right. But he also um, was a TV writer. He wrote on Freddy's Nightmares, the Nightmare on Elm Street TV right. show. And interestingly, he wrote uh, In the Mouth of Madness for John Carpenter, uh, or at least uh, helped write it. And he wrote the story for the Judge Dredd film. Right. Right. Uh, was that the like the Stallone Judge Dredd yes. one? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, which is um, it's not great, right. but yeah, it's a Stallone pick. I mean, it's it's high profile, and it, and it and it was one of. To be fair, I know there, the, you know, Hollywood's all about the comic book to film now. Um, yeah, and there was a time when we got like a Phantom movie and we got a, a Shadow movie, um, but but for a, for a long time, making a comic book film work was a really hard sell. Uh, only. You know, super. The original Superman had done well. I guess its second version, second movie, had done well, and they did well enough to keep cranking those out. But and then the the Burton Batman's. But to see somebody take Judge Dredd from the comics and try to do a movie out of that at that time was, I think, a, a little bit more of a of a risk. And so, for for good or for bad, I, I remember the movie not being terrific, but um, but seeing it, it's not. But seeing it in the theater, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know, but but it, at least it was taking a, a comic book property that wasn't Batman or Superman and, and trying to do something with it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's just clear that he you know, he pitched he didn't write the final script no, for the episode, no, no. but he pitched the story. Yeah. And it's clear that he's even though he's a Trek fan, he's an outsider. And Trek has a long history. I mean, you've talked yourself about submitting scripts yeah. of taking um, submitted scripts. But it just seems weird that so early in a show, and not even not even in that back nine that we mentioned before, where often you'll take chances on scripts um, because you're just filling out the season, like they would turn to a guy who <laughs> has not a lot of experience, yeah. you know, writing sci-fi and Trek. It just seems to me like they were trying to warm up to the the head of New Line Cinema. Oh well, that's possible. Yeah, I, I yeah. hadn't I hadn't thought about that angle, but sure. Um, so like, oh, great idea. We'll, we'll do an episode out of it. And then Braga who, who, you know, has written many, many episodes and will write many more, 
says, you know, the, uh, I got this one, and uh, and and thus a, a terrible episode is born. Um, yeah, it feels like producers uh, scratching the backs of other producers. Mm, that's me. interesting. Yeah, this could be a real reason why this one started on the wrong foot. And I think that's what the real problem is. If you read something like the book Inside Star Trek, which is a memoir about the making of the original series by producers um, Herb Solo and Bob Justman, it's a tale of producers wrangling creatives. Mm. You know, Solo and Justman, they think they know better than everyone. <laughs> I mean, they're producers. but And then sometimes they contribute an idea or two, but they get that their job is to shepherd the ideas of the writers to the screen. And it's not to roll their sleeves up and finally get all those short stories they couldn't get published, you know, onto TV. Uh, I think it's an example, you know, of this episode, and I don't know, maybe Braga in his career going forward. Yeah, uh, of producers who are out of their depth creatively, but they can't let go of the reins. Yeah, yeah, I, it, it's definitely one where just it went off the rails uh, right from the start. You know, there are a lot of people who hate this episode not for the horror show and the salamander babies, but for the warp ten business, and that's. Yeah. That's a whole other reason for people to not like it. That doesn't bother me at all. Um, like, like of all the things in this episode that bother me, uh, I mean, okay. So can can I jump into Warp Ten for a second? Yeah, sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Warp Ten, or at least as close as I can get. Uh, oh no, as, as we're told we should. Um, so okay, so in the original series, we know that there are a couple of references to things that are above Warp Ten. Then yes. then TNG begins. And uh, Gene Roddenberry says, let's get a handle on this. You know, we were kind of making this up as we went before. And what if we kind of codified this? Which mm. I, I like. I like the – I mean, and I don't have a problem with a show, especially one with roots as far back as the 60s, saying, okay, you know what? Let's let's write some stuff down. Let's actually make the – the star dates mean something instead of just being random numbers. And, and let's, right. let's talk about what it really does mean to go to warp 10. So I like the idea of warp 10. So this is now called Eugene's limit, right? Um, Gene named for Gene Roddenberry. And they put a theoretical limit imposed on warp propulsion drives. So they suggested that warp 10 would be this unattainable maximum warp. And that once you got into the nines, 9.1, 9.2, 9.3, you're getting incre you're, you're getting exponentially faster than the previous right. than the previous point one, point two, whatever, but that you will never ever be ever be able to get all the way to warp ten. That it's just this bending curve, much like trying to get to the speed of light, right? I mean, like we we're told I know that I, I, I actually looked a little bit into science, some science stuff before this, and, and there are some thoughts that maybe the speed of light isn't as fast as you can go. And I do know from listening to too many episodes of uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's Star Talk, sorry to send people sure. to another podcast, but um, right. but I do know that the universe is the, – the galaxies are expanding in the universe faster than the speed of light. Which doesn't make any sense because nothing can go faster than the speed of light until you realize it's the fabric of space that's expanding. Don't quote me on this because I really don't know what I'm talking about. But, right. okay, so to get back to Trek, they decided they would have this warp limit and that, that you could go as high in the nines as you wanted to go as, as your ship could go. So now they get this idea on threshold to, in this episode... To say, well, like you said at the beginning, they were sitting around in the writer's room and they said, what if, right? And that's where a lot of great science fiction starts. And they sure. said, what if you could break warp 10? What would it be like? And, you know, what would you have to do? Um, I think it's got to be a little bit more than finding a more stable dilithium, perhaps. But um, but they suggest, OK, let, let's say that for some reason, Kim and Torres and, and Paris are able to figure this out. and um, he gets past it, then what do we do with it? Um, a lot of people have a real problem with this. This is their biggest problem with the episode, that it broke the Eugene's Limit law that the show had even started. And it even left Rick Sternbach posting to a news group a, a way of sort of explaining this. Did you read right. this? Uh, I've, I've heard about okay, it. I didn't so, I have, it. so you've got so – uh, let, me, let me read this. It's pretty short. So he says in his news group, he says, I think what may have happened – with the silly Warp 10 episode, he's talking about Threshold, was that there was a coupling of the energy from the shuttle to all of the energy and the matter of the universe, 
which might be possible if we're looking at a finite system, and the shuttle was able to access any point anywhere by some amazing tunneling phenomenon, which shrank the normal 3D distances to points, much like all the universe being squished into a pinpoint at the Big Bang because it was all energy with no need for elbow room. And then he says, phew, to which I echo, phew. Um, that's a whole lot of <laughs> explaining to make this episode work. Um, yeah. And, and uh, honestly, it still just doesn't even work. Um, but they thought, what if we can have a ship go past warp 10 um, I, I guess, and I was thinking about other other things that have done this. It, am I wrong that this is kind of what happens at the end of Interstellar? That by going into the black hole, they're able to warp time and be at all times and all places at once? Isn't that what, what him going through that sort of library of things and pulling books out or pushing books out is kind of like him looking for the right moment in time? Maybe. you got me you got me on yeah. that one the closest thing that i could come up with was it's it's clearly like a parallel to uh chuck, chuck yeager breaking the yes. sound barrier oh, yeah 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 i mean the, the and and there's this weird scene at the beginning uh where it's totally a throwaway scene done for no reason to but the to heighten the drama in the moment where janeway comes to paris the night before and says yeah. the doctor has said you can't do it because you have a heart abnormality you know a no a, right. Uh, his, it's an enzyme enzyme imbalance thank you and that you have a two percent chance of having a brain hemorrhage you know or, or and 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 if you do this and he freaks out he gives us a speech about how you know his he was supposed to be something and he never amounted to anything and this is his one chance and she's like okay go get him tiger and yeah then it, it's never the only other time it's spoken of is when the freak show starts happening in the sick bay and she comes in to talk to the to to the doctor and she's like, does this have something to do with the enzyme Im imbalance? And he's like, no. <laughs> and that's <Nope. laughs> yeah. that's it. I mean, it would have actually made some sense. It, well, not really. But it like if there had been a chance and he took it and he and he was punished for taking that chance, it might have meant something to the plot. There are so many ways that this episode <laughs> might have meant something. That's really my chief criticism about yeah. it is because nothing really happens. Yeah. I mean, it's he breaks the warp 10 barrier, turns into a salamander, he gets fixed, it's over. And there's an act, the entire third act is just Paris gasping in sick oh, yeah. day. And the doctor's like, oh, he's really sick. I mean, that's not yeah, and, and a compelling story. Let's put him in the warp core and bombard him with radiation. That'll <laughs> yeah, jeez. Right. Let's put the whole ship at risk for this guy nobody right. likes. Yeah. Um, the, 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 another the, another problem that I, I see is that Voyager is the first show, in my opinion, where the characters are relegated to a list of characteristics or foibles. Mm -hmm. I'm not calling for a referendum on the charisma of the actors. In no, Voyager, no, 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 no. But yeah. it seems like every character to me is a short list of basic motivations that substitute for character. It's like you bring up the thing with, you know, the enzymatic imbalance. It's just an opportunity for Tom Paris to make this speech right, to, pull out the to remind Bible us what his here's my, mo my motivation is. is. Yeah. Yeah. And he's the poster child for this problem. Like he's just an edifice of weak story hooks that's lashed together to make a character. Yeah. He's got a famous dad. He likes the 20th century. He's a smart ass. And apparently the writers placed him at the center of the episode because they felt the character had been underused in the series so far. And I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, what do you really what do you do with it? They were all underused because they didn't do anything with any of the characters. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, uh, you know, talking about Ensign Kim and, and uh, to throw him in there. This is a guy who's never promoted in the entire seven years of the show. We don't yeah. know. Would, would he, doesn't he play like the the bassoon or something? I, he uh, the, the clarinet. clarinet yeah. Thank you. Sorry. So um, he plays the clarinet. Um, likes science. He's got a surprising amount of game. Yeah. <laughs> he, he does. Uh, he does date a little bit. That's true. Look, and again. Garrett Wang is a really great guy. He works with the Trek Track at Dragon Con. He's he's yeah. one of the people who runs that. He's a fabulous guy. And all these guys, all these actors and actresses who were on the show, you know, Will Wheaton suffered from this. They were they had bad writing. You know, like they're great folks, good actors, but there's some really trash writing sometimes for these characters. And yeah. they can only say what's on the page, you know? Um yeah, this happens a lot to uh, characters in other Trek yeah. uh, that are never given dimension behind or beyond their Bible entries, like Wesley Crusher, Prodigy, right. or Troy, Sensitive, or Dr. Pulaski, Mean. Right. Um, as an author, 
uh, and specifically as a historical fiction author, what do you do to try to put character over plot? So I try to, before I ever write a story about a character, before I ever put them on the page of a novel, one of the big things that I do is besides the, the group of, of fears and, and dreams and, and physical characteristics that make them up, all these things we're talking about with, with Voyager and the other shows, I also try to think about the things that defined them before they walk on my page. Like what's a, uh, what I always do with all my characters is I say, what's a story about who the, why this person is who we see when we see them right now? You know, what's a mm-hmm. story from their past? Why did they become this person? And then when I know that, I try to build a character arc where they deal with that and they, and you know, with all the things that they already like to do, whether they're musical or whether they're artistic or whatever, that's not the only thing that defines them. They have to be, they have to be people with flaws. They have to be people with hopes and dreams. They have to be people who've been affected by things before your story begins and then deal with those issues as they go along. And look, Paris does in a way deal with his daddy issues in a scene, which as in, in reading more about this episode, he wrote. Um, so at the very end of the episode, he apparently didn't like the dialogue that they had written for the very end. I don't know how you could, how you could like any dialogue for the end of this episode, because what in the world do you say after you've become sal- you've kidnapped your captain, turned her into a salamander, ha- uh, impregnated her, <laughs> had babies with her, and then you you know you wake up in, in the next day having your um, so about last night talk in sick bay. So yeah, but but he took it and he reworked it and gave us some really ham handed dialogue. <laughs> I've heard that he had input. I, I, di- I don't know that he wrote it. I hope he didn't right. because uh, if he wrote – and let me give you a little yeah, exchange I, yeah, between well, Paris and January. Yeah. Paris says, it seems, Captain, that I still have a few barriers yes. to break. I just hope they're not theoretical impossibilities. And Janeway says, somehow, I don't think they will be. Oh, no. Oh, no. Don't Before quit your day that, job. He, this out, he says, it's not other people's opinions I should be worried about. It's mine. It's no. mine. <laughs> Oh, oh, Tom. All right, Newt boy. Yeah. So, I mean, in a way, he is dealing with these issues, but, but, oh my gosh, it, it, they're forced into one episode. There's, and then, and then the next time they need him to show any kind of emotion, they'll pull it out again. He hasn't, yeah. it's not like he's fixed anything. No. You know, and, and, and I guess this is it. They just, they kept going back to the well of the, of the writer's Bible. They said, oh, that's who he is, and regurgitating that every single time. Um, yeah. So having your characters act out of character yes. can create conflict, and then your story can be about how they have to justify or contextualize their actions. Right. You know what it means to do what they did, but otherwise, yeah. If you're doing what what Voyager does, it's just a list of things that happen to your character. Right. Putting your character, like knowing who your character is when they walk on stage, and then putting them in a moral quandary that forces them to reevaluate who, who they yeah. are and what they've decided about themselves. You know, that's yeah. that whole business about. About a, a character wearing a you know a person wearing a mask of the person they think they are, and then you force them to take that mask off and to be somebody else. But this episode doesn't do that. You know, it no. it, it it pays pays lip service to it, but it just it doesn't it doesn't. It's hard to have consequences when you can transform a man-sized salamander back into a human being with no. In problems. the in the in, yeah in, in the blink of a of a of a scene change. Of a yeah, a commercial break, break yeah. or a scene change. I mean, it's. It's preposterous. There's no consequences. There's no lingering after effects. Um, yeah. And, you know, you mentioned the whole um, breaking the warp yes. barrier thing before and the kind of rules that these sci-fi shows have to operate under. I'm not going to push my glasses up and try to explain why you can't go yeah, faster yeah, yeah. than warp yeah, 10 yeah. Or, or you can't beam through shields or you can't travel to the mirror universe on mushrooms. Right. I mean, it's, it's fiction. Absolutely. Everything's negotiable. Uh, everything's negotiable, but in order to get your audience to believe in saying things, you have to give them something they can hold on to, some rules so the internal logic of the show like hangs together. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that by, you know, by having them just sort of jerry rig a, a a way to 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 go faster than you know to to be all things and on all places at once, you know, I I love the idea that that is is Q capable of doing that? Is a is a character like that? capable of 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 warping reality and and bending the rules of the universe to whatever they want to do i love that because then that's sure. th- those are the kind of characters then that we have to deal with and and you know it's it's like the old flash villain um it was you know, like uh abracadabra the one who comes from the future and everything they do looks like like magic 
but they're just doing right. science. And and it's the old yeah. it's the old Clark um, uh, axiom that that any any technology. Uh, what is? Do you know it? Can you say it with better than I can? Any techno, any any sufficiently advanced technology um, is indistinguishable from magic. magic, something like that, right? So yeah, yeah, and and but but when our guys do it, and then like it, it's like somebody picked up the sorcerer's wand and waved it and and got burned by it in this episode, you know, like yeah. like they and they didn't, but that's not what it's about. <laughs> it's not like no, no, that's not. What it's in about fact, at all. in fact, when they, when they have the the, the scene at the beginning where they tell uh, Janeway what they're going about to do, and they they tell her, you know, and Chakotay turns to her and he says, "Should we even do this? You know, like, like is this is this a, is this a place for us to play?" And she's like, "Oh, you know, in the last two centuries, we've proven that we can handle our technology pretty well. Go for it." And I'm like, "Whoa, that's a pretty sweeping generalization, right?" There. Themes of hubris <laughs> incoming, yeah. Um, I think that actually the last two centuries at any point in human evolution would show that we're massively incapable of handling new technologies responsibly. Um, yeah. But but sure, go for it. You know, <laughs> uh, that's really how the, this episode lets Trek down yeah. for me is thematically. I mean, I don't his tongue comes out, whatever. I don't really care about that kind of stuff. But it's all well and good that you can't have your characters create a way to get immediately home. And that's the whole sure. premise is that they can't get home yet. But the way the episode resolves is a betrayal of what Trek has always been about for me, which is discovery. They right. make this incredible discovery. They break the warp 10 barrier. And like you said, I don't think the episode is doing this on purpose, but it sets up this theme of kind of hubris. And ultimately, our characters are punished yeah. for, for exploring. And their reward for their amazing discovery is a violation of their minds and bodies. Yeah. And then they just throw the discovery in the yeah. trash and they say, yeah, we're not doing that's that the, again. I mean, that's not Star To Trek. me, that's the, that's the kicker at the end of the episode is I, I laugh about the salamander babies because it's just so funny. But <laughs> yes. they did it, right? They, they broke the warp 10 barrier. Tom Paris was able to be all places at once. We see the the information from the sector that downloads from the logs that records like everything all around them in the brief time that he was gone. Yes, he turns into a freaky salamander dude and and gets crazy pants, but the doctor is able to turn him back at the with by by just dosing him with some antiprotons. So it worked. Like, but then they just totally walk away from it. It's like, well, okay, that was pretty. That was some pretty weird stuff. Better not mess with that again. And it's like, but wh what? You, this is yeah. like the biggest. They they talk about it at the beginning in these hushed homes. Like like if you could do this, you could go any place, any time. I mean, you're talking about essentially having the 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 power of the spore drive from Discovery or the power of the Guardian of Forever in a ship that just jump yeah. where it needs to jump in time and space. And uh, they just throw it in the trash bin at the end. Why don't they just go home right. to Earth and then just say, hey, get the anti-proton. We're going to need a yeah, lot of anti-protons. Here, this is the plan I worked out. All right. So you get everybody. You, you, you put them in their, in their quarters. You lock their quarters. You set up the, the Voyager to do it. You're going to jump back to Earth. The doctor, who is not a physical being, is there on the ship waiting to flood the damn thing with anti-protons when they get back. You jump to Earth. Right. You nuke it. And then everybody's back to normal and you're home. Done. Yeah, right. It, I mean, they got a data on board. I mean, with data, data could have done it too, but the doctor could do it. He Data would have absolutely right, done right, it. Right, totally. So, uh, and they probably would have sent data through on the, you know, he would have probably been the pilot. Um, oh, they wouldn't have known until they had gone that something <laughs> was, right. uh, was harmful about the right. process. So, I'd have been uh, they, why, not, why not send an un, uh, unmanned shuttle out <laughs> with this technology? Because like you yeah. pointed out, they have like 5 billion gigaquads of yeah. cartography information. They could use this to chart the entire way back home, or they could just send an unmanned shuttle on autopilot to Earth with a post-it right. note attached hey, to it saying, in. send help. Yeah. Get, get yeah. Barkley on the line and see if he can figure it out so a little sooner. So like, um, uh, th this brings me to another one of my, my things. This is about all Trek. This isn't, this isn't just a Voyager criticism. I want to talk briefly about what it means to be a pilot in, in Star Trek. Okay. Because we, you know, in TNG, we get all this bravado from, from, um, uh, from Riker about being a pilot. And, and I think there's a terrible episode where like Picard 
takes the doesn't it go like pilot them through a through an asteroid field at some Booby point? Trap. And at some point, doesn't a joystick pop up from a console at some point? That is in Star Trek Insurrection. Okay. Oh, oh whew, yeah. Okay. We just we 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 just won't even go there right now. Less yeah. Than about, yeah. Uh, that to me might be even worse than Threshold. I said it. So. Uh, oh, poor Michael Pollock. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. To be a pilot in Star Trek appears that unlike a pilot in our world piloting an aircraft where there is a, a, an actual purpose for the joystick and, and some, some touch and feel to it, being a pilot in Star Trek involves tapping a lot of buttons really fast. And yep. you, were, you were suggesting send an unmanned probe back. But the joke of it is that from the way that Tom pilots the shuttle, like the computer couldn't do it, or if the computer could do it, why... Why is Tom pushing buttons? You know, right. like if, if you can tell the computer compensate for the vector displacement or whatever the techno babble is that they throw out in this episode, if if the computer can accomplish all that, then just strap Tom in in the back seat and have the computer do it. You know, but instead yeah. he's in there pushing lots of buttons, and it seems to me that in Star Trek, being a pilot is nothing more than knowing which buttons to push really fast. Yeah, I think a lot of it it has to do with just the uh, mechanics of shooting a TV yeah. show and having they something that something. we can see in yeah. here. They do this. Uh, they do this a lot on all Trek, but definitely on Voyager, where like Harry Kim is scanning for the shuttle and can't find it, yes. and Chakotay tells him to increase yeah. the scan range, and it's like, I think Harry Kim was going to do why that, wasn't he but doing we just it have to begin to have, with. Why do you do a half yeah. scan? We have to, yeah, right. We don't, come on, we don't want to be uh, as wasteful here. Just use half a scan. Are they burning dilithium out here? I don't understand. You're raised in a barn? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Do they turn the lights off in every room before they leave? I don't understand. So, uh... (laughs) apparently, uh, well, being a pilot in the uh, Star Trek universe is just whoever the best console jockey is. Um, It's kind of like that unfortunate incident with the guy who stole the plane in Seattle recently. Oh, yeah. Uh, where the he was talking to the control tower and they're like, you know, you got to be careful. And he's like, I've played some video games. I think I'm going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. But uh, at least in shows like Firefly, you've got, you know, when Wash is at the helm of Serenity, he has a physical two-handled, like, steering wheels, you know, joystick. A yoke. Yeah. yeah. Like, a, yeah. What is it called? A, yeah, a yoke. A yoke. I, I am also not a pilot in addition to not being a doctor. <laughs> and... um you know, he's wrenching it. You know, when he does a crazy eye, but he's like wrenching it back. And so, you know, when that that gives the the actor something to do, like the way a person driving a car in a show can really wrench at the wheel. When, when they've yeah. just got buttons on an, uh, uh, you know, on an L cars display. I mean, the poor guys are just left like basically doing a data, you know, data doing the piano moves on the on the the the, the, the glass top. So um, yeah. anyway, just my little pet peeve about what it takes to be a pilot. And like you said, it, you know, why why couldn't the I, I don't know why the, the computer is supposed to be light years faster and smarter than the humans. It should be able to correct for all that stuff. But you got to. Yeah. And I mean, we get into like, uh, why are there people on the ship at yeah. all if the computer can do everything by itself? Yeah. So the whole show is kind of locked into these sort of problems or conventions. Yeah. And it. It's even extended to a prequel like Discovery. The, yeah. Even the new show, all, all of Trek is, in my opinion, a victim of previous continuity and what we've agreed to already accept from yeah. the show. So then it becomes harder to push against the walls of the established universe when you come up with new ideas. Sure. As somebody who's written steampunk novels with dragons and <laughs> monsters, do you worry about the details of your setting overwhelming yeah, your Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and this is something, it's a trap you can fall into. You can you can put too many gizmos and too many um, too many things in there so that you, you overwhelm the characters. Um, and, and we know from watching too much Trek uh, if there is such a thing, but we know from watching a lot of Trek, let's say, uh, that the 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 worst scenes are the ones where they use techno babble to bail themselves out. You know, where they yeah. where they just throw a bunch of terms around, like the Doctor does later on. Where the anti proton thing, his idea is let's destroy all of their new DNA, and the old DNA will reassert itself. Really? Let's <laughs> right. the, you know, right. what if it doesn't? So you know, like I mean, yeah. the so the. Yeah, the the worst times are when you let the technology overwhelm your your characters and your story. But again, we're seeing that here. Some of the social themes that Trek uh, sticks to, and I enjoy Trek for, are totally abused in this episode <laughs> as well. Like, uh, they just abandoned those little mutant kids. Absolutely um, abandoned. 
and they are they are new a life. Brand that new is species, literally what new life form. What Trek is right. looking for, yeah. And so I guess they're not treating them as sentient. They just leave them right. there. I, I mean, they are they are supposed to be the future evolution of humanity. Um, yeah. And which was Brandon Braga sick the day they they taught evolution? This is yes. not right. what evolution so is that, or, or how that's it works. Of my, he wrote the episode. Yeah. He wrote the episode Genesis for oh, TNG know. as well, where everybody uh, gets the atavistic traits and turn into gorillas and yeah, flies and stuff like that. Yeah, which is a terrible that. episode. Yeah. Not great. And he also um, later developed in 2005 a show for CBS about aliens editing uh, humans' uh, genetic information. Right, which was called. And it was called Threshold. Can't, he just yeah. couldn't get away. So yeah, Come let's, on. Talk, let, let's talk about evolution just for a moment because I know that Brandon Braga is a listener and, and he would probably appreciate it. Um, this is for, to help yeah, him. That's right. Him, we're, yes. Yeah, we're, we're just – this is constructive criticism. For the next exactly. uh, show that he writes where, where he uh, forces someone to evolve, um, evolution requires several unique creatures within a species to be naturally selected and then reproduce with each other over and over again over time. Heredity and mutation create change over that period of time. Uh, a single individu- individual can have his DNA mutated like by radiation but cannot evolve – forward in any kind of imitation of where a larger group of individuals will go through natural selection, heredity, and uh, fortunate random mutation. This whole evolving forward stuff is total crap. And it's just like no matter what Braga says he was trying to do with maybe we're de-evolving, maybe we're going back to some simpler life form. The thing is, dude, we won't know until we get there. It's not like it's coded into our genes that we're someday going to become luminous beings like the Banana Man in TNG or or space slugs in your Threshold episode. We don't know right. because <laughs> because the world hasn't shaped us. Mutation and heredity haven't shaped us yet. Oh, yeah. So uh, now I got to look up who who wrote the Banana Man episode. <laughs> I've never heard him called that before. You know exactly that. what I'm talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, poor Dr. Crusher, another example of bad episodes for a character. Uh, this show has never really taken on Brandon Braga before. He's got a lot of flack over yeah. the years for his perceived mismanagement of the franchise, along with executive producer Rick Berman. Um, you know, the ratings plummeted yearly on Voyager. And, of course, Star Trek Enterprise oversaw the then death of the franchise. Um, I, I don't know. What's your opinion on the decline of mid-2000s Trek? Yeah, um... I, I, you know, I was thinking about this and why I had abandoned Voyager. I've now, I've since watched all of them. Um, not, oh, okay. not recently, but, but back when they started streaming on, on, uh, Netflix, I, um, I, I watched through all of them. Uh, but, uh, sure. but many of them I've only seen one time. Um, they're, they're not great. The thing is, they're also not terrible with some exceptions, uh, threshold as a case in point. But my, my thought was this, that, Ensign Kim, to me, is is the perfect representation of Voyager. By that, I don't mean what he looks like or anything, although I, it was, pleasingly, one of the most diverse television shows, certainly in Trek's history, uh, of being already diverse uh, historically. Um, you sweep yeah. across... Having that, an Asian in general right, is good news. Right, you sweep across that bridge, and you see a, a, a white woman as a captain. You've got a black Vulcan. You've got a Native American as the first officer. You've got Ensign Kim up there uh, at the science or ops or whatever he's doing, you know, and, and you've got you've got one white guy, Paris, on the bridge. That's that's really great. And I, and I, I applaud that and I love it. And so I, but but that's not what I'm, ta- I'm not talking about what he looks like. But Kim as a character, he's nice. He's the one character who retains a hopeful optimism about getting home and keeps trying to get home for seven seasons over and over again. But he never ever changes right Mm. he i already mentioned before and it's it's a it's already kind of a joke uh among trek fans he never gets promoted from ensign to for to even lieutenant junior grade he went to the writers of the show the producers at one point he said can i get a promotion already and they told him this is exactly what they told him somebody's got to be ensign (laughs) right okay (laughs) and to me that is what voyager feels like Right. It was the yeah. show that never was promoted past its premise. Interesting. Right. And again, I mean, this is no slight to Garrett Wang. I think he's an awesome guy and a good and a great sure. actor. But again, he could only say and do what they put in the scripts for him. And I think that the show, there's a moment early on when 
when the, they're trying to defeat the Kazon, and they could they start to bring together other races in this area to maybe form a I don't know something like a a federation of uh, of other right. planets, right? Right. And then it, before the episode is over, of course, the reset button is hit. The, all the other people betray them, sell them out, and 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 they decide that they're just going to keep being Starfleet and traveling through the Delta Quadrant on their own. It's stuff like that where they just said, we're going to revert to what we know works. It, it, yeah, the show just kind of gives up yes. at that point. And, just, and, yeah, and they just yeah. say, we're just going to be a, a week in and week out Star Trek show where the show where the ship finds a new planet or a new people every, you know, every week we deal with whatever that problem is. We hit the reset button at the end and we move on. And so it is it's like comfort food. You can watch you can watch every episode of Voyager and be like, I'm watching Trek and you are watching Trek, but you're not watching anything that's groundbreaking. You're not watching anything that's pushing boundaries. I, I, I do enjoy Discovery. I have some problems with it, but I applaud them for taking chances and trying to break new ground. Um, yeah. Because the last thing we needed was just a rehash of TNG um, or, or Voyager. I liked DS9 because it became more of an arc type story. And though it's hard to get into, like it's hard to jump in. It's one of the reasons I, I, I desperately want to do a DS9 episode with you, but I keep thinking like, which one do I do? They're all connected so much. Yeah. And so to talk about one, you talk about three or four. It's talk about a really great one. You talk about three or four, you know, and but so to, to remain, you mentioned this earlier, to remain episodic, they decided to remain episodic. They decided to to just fall into the old tropes of of the of, of TNG and TOS. And I think it just be, the problem is they became as forgettable as Ensign Kim. It's just forgettable. Yeah. It's not bad. It's not great. It's just there. The Star Trek factory just making homogenized yeah. Trek. Yeah, that's a great. That's a that's a good insight. Uh, I also like your uh, observation of the multiracial makeup yeah. of the bridge, and I realized that Tom Paris isn't just the white guy; he's the, the white, white guy. guy. Right? They well, took well, all the white guy's stories and gave it to the true. one token that's white true. guy, and that's yeah. I find. Thank you. You've helped me realize why I yeah. hate him so yeah. much. That part just all throughout the episode. Uh, he's just being a real brat, but like that speech in uh, Sick Bay where he's like, "What about right. me?" And maybe, oh, yeah. maybe I. It's just all this privilege is oh, like, yeah. oh, I never thought about that, but absolutely. I mean, he's the he's the guy that like racist. There's white racism, you know. I mean, he's not saying that. <laughs> he, he's yeah, that guy right. who's out there saying people discriminate against white people all the time, you know. Like all salamanders <laughs> matter. Uh, except and at that point, I mean, that's behind. why. Um, yeah, that's why Janeway is one of my favorite captains because she takes that – she's not happy, but she takes that in stride where I'd be tempted to be like, <laughs> okay, what do you want on your tombstone? Right. I know. Yeah, I don't think that uh, – I don't think that Cisco would put up with that crap. Um, so, Of course, they um, get together uh, later and what I want to know is yeah. uh, at what point exactly in this process do they mate? Uh, can a newt give consent? Right. Uh, these are really squeaky questions and Probably a squeaky I think process. it's good that – Yes, and I think that it's uh, good that the episode. Did, I think it's good the episode chooses not to entertain them, as I don't think it has the maturity to. <laughs> yeah. But exploring them might have been a better. Sure, episode. Uh, you know, and we get this really ham-fisted piece of dialogue from um, Janeway in in Sick Bay once they've been where she's trying to sort of take. It well, back. or she says, or he says, so hey, you know, I'm sorry about you know impregnating you with my salamander babies, and she's like. Who knows, Tom? You know, many times it's the female of the species who initiates the the. And you're you're like, is this? The... Yeah, that doesn't fix so anything. It, it's like the writer is kind of saying, like, he he didn't really rape her salamander self. Do you know? It, it could have been the other way around. That's the out that they give themselves. <laughs> yes, yeah. I don't know. It's really awful. Uh, well, someone has explored these oh. issues. The internet, on, if you spend long enough on the internet, you'll find anything. Oh, okay. And I found a Voyager fanfic entitled Breaking Another Threshold, <laughs> the summary of which is uh, what happens that evening after Janeway and Paris are released from sick bay. And I tell you oh. more, but all I can hear is my own brain screaming forever. Oh, I, I'll have to look that up. I actually would love to read that story. Um, <laughs> oh, I, please. Please. <laughs> Please, for your family's sake, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, boy, oh boy. I, I do have one uh, crackpot theory for you. Um, you used to have oh, a feature, uh, right, where you would talk about the yes. – uh, what did you call it? The um, 
uh, but we're like like crazy fan theories. Okay, so this isn't something I've read, but uh, as I watched the episode uh, again, um, I I thought, okay, wait, what if so Tom actually breaks the warp ten barrier, but everything after that moment is a crazy hallucination brought on by an actual brain hemorrhage from the enzyme imbalance. My retcon would be that he didn't really break warp 10. He just, he, I don't know. He ends up in a subspace conduit that's got pe- peculiar radiation effects. Pocket universe. Uh, yeah, where he becomes yeah, a right. salamander. Yeah. Yeah. And so they haven't actually violated that law. That's still in place. And, you know, they can turn into salamanders. That's fine. But, right. of course, later on, you have to do an episode where the ship is attacked and boarded by three full-grown angry oh, yeah. cyborg newts that are looking for their deadbeat parents. That would be amazing. Like, you know how they, they, they have all these anthologies where people write stories from, you know, the, the, <laughs> yes. from the world. I now know what story I'm going to write forever and submit to every single Star Trek anthology. I am going to write the the further adventures of the three salamander the the, teenage mutant the three, ninja yeah, three <laughs> salamanders uh, <Yeah. laughs> and the, that's right yeah the, you know, or teenage mutant ninja salamanders so uh, uh yeah they the, their story needs to be told uh, yeah definitely uh, they they get left behind on Dega but Chakotay is just like <laughs> like I can't deal I'm out we're leaving these space babies behind um they, you know this is a this is if you want to talk about um, uh, breaking the prime directive, how about um, creating a new species all by yourself and then dumping it on a planet yeah. <laughs> right. before you take off and leave it? Um, probably worse than anything Picard ever did or or or, Sha- or, uh, or Kirk ever did to break the uh, prime directive. I, I agree. Uh, before we wrap up, let's talk all-time bad episodes yeah. in the Star Trek franchise. I mean, it's a hard thing to judge. Uh, as I said the last time you were on the show, uh, one person's Darmok is another person's, well, Darmok. Uh, <laughs> but did you have any episodes that were real stinky standouts for you? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Sub Rosa, um, which, yeah. uh, again, was another Braga-written one. Um, That's just terrible. I, I remember in Voyager, um, weirdly, the, the episode where... We watched Janeway's ancestor uh, protesting something in a town. Eleven fifty nine. Yeah. Yeah. It's te- it's just it's just boring. I don't understand yeah. what it was about. I, I like. I just remember it being like, where where's the Voyager? I don't. You know. Um. Like I look. I, I love 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 the 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 episode where Avery Brooks gets to play the science fiction writer in the forties and uh, sure. beyond. Uh, is it far uh, beyond the stars? Far beyond the stars. Uh, I, I'm not opposed to them getting out of, out of the Star Trek uniforms and, and doing something different with the characters. Sometimes those are the most brilliant episodes, but that one was terrible. Uh, I mentioned earlier Code of Honor. Um, that one is so insultingly bad. Um, that's the one it, for, for listeners, if you don't remember, where they go to a planet that's um, basically like uh, it, it, all, all, the, all the actors are black. And, uh, you know, the, the, it's a, a planet full of, of black people that are wearing these these sort of faux African space clothes. Right. Tasha Yar fights with this spiky ball on the end of her arm. It is so Gene Roddenberry. I mean, like it is, it is so original series. Um, it's terrible. Uh, yeah. The director on that episode. Yeah. Uh, whose name escapes me right now, but he was uh, f- Russ Mayberry. That's what it was. Um, he was fired like halfway through <laughs> because he, hire at all black actors and apparently it was never necessarily set in stone that it would be the quote-unquote black planet in fact early on they wanted to have them be all kind of lizardy type people oh wow um but then he started like hiring all black actors for this supposedly because i can't believe we haven't covered this on the show yet. yeah supposedly because he wanted to increase diversity well yeah thought it would be a good idea it's a great idea to bring a whole lot of black actors in but not when it's like the 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 primitive yeah. African be you know like right yeah well the costuming got involved yeah. and it just became this sort of uh, oh. sort of convergent emergent uh, sort of racism <laughs> thing that happened yeah yeah the like bad. politically incorrect nightmare episode yeah a uh, whirlwind yeah I'm all for the diverse casting I love it um, I I have caught myself more than once calling New Discovery the uh, Star Trek diversity um, but yeah, sure. um, but I love it. But but not when you do that, um, you know, the, the, boy, there's other bad. G- give me some of your favorite bad ones. Well, I was going to say that at the uh, 50th anniversary Vegas convention, they had a panel about bad episodes and the audience got to participate in kind of uh, 
duel to the death, you know, round robin type thing. Uh-huh. And they whittled their picks down to a top 10 list, uh, which Ooh. I will present here. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. Uh, number 10, they had Precious Cargo, which is an Enterprise episode. That's the one with Padma Lakshmi. She's a frozen dinner. And they thaw her out. Oh, wow. Uh, number nine was the alternative factor yeah. uh, from the original series. Uh, number eight was move along home. Oh, from Deep Space right. Nine. a terrible episode. Yeah. That's a real bad one. Uh, number seven was, and the children shall lead from the original series. Is that the one with the, that's the one where Marvin Bell or Melvin belly is in a sparkly pool cover and he's, uh, got the little kids who are like doing the wishing people into the cornfield thing. Oh yeah. Okay. I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, number six was sub Rosa. Mm hmm. Uh, previously mentioned, number five, Shades of Grey. Yeah. Number four was Turnabout Intruder. Yeah, that's one from old series I forgot to mention. That's terrible. That's the one with the shifting mustache and and the weird negative effects, right? That's just terrible. That's the one where Kirk and his former lover switch places, and it's, like, extremely sexist. Oh, right, okay. Right, <laughs> it right. establishes that uh, women can't be Starfleet captains. Right, yes. And, yeah. Which we all know, uh, oh, yeah, of course it's true, yeah. Right, which has <laughs> gone forward until the 24th century, of course. Uh, number three is where Threshold sits. Number yeah. two is Code of Honor. And number one is These Are the Voyages, the finale of Enterprise. Oh, well, sure, okay. I, I get that. I mean, so... That, I I feel like though that 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 calling that the worst uh, is because of the dis- the whole decision to take the the characters of of their own show out of you know not make them the main characters but instead give it over to Riker and Troy. I get that. Um, it was a terrible terrible decision. Um, yeah. But I would still argue that that structurally it's a better episode than some of the others mentioned. But I get the, I get the criticism of that one. And coming at the end, it has the weight of all the previous <laughs> yeah. episodes on its shoulders. Yeah. So I make a distinction, too, between um, just poorly constructed yes. and, and bad. Yeah. Like, just because an episode is cheesy and makes me cringe doesn't – I don't think it means that it's an objectively bad episode. Um, one that is <laughs> both poorly constructed and bad, uh, in my opinion, is the DS9 episode, Let He Who Is Without Sin. Remind this me what is, happens in that one. This is the one where uh, Worf and Jadzia Dax are sort of enjoying their newly formed relationship and they go to Ryza. Oh my gosh, and Worf messes with the weather system? Yes. That is a terrible episode. Like, Worf is the. Just, like, you want to just kill Worf in that episode. Yeah. And what's worse. Actually, I'm not. Well, well let me let me explain. <laughs> uh, if I can. Uh, the retarded sexuality that's often on display in Star Trek yeah. is a- everywhere in this episode. Um, and it always happens when they go to Ryza. Mm-hmm. Um, the worst thing is, is that, you know, we actually get a somewhat tantalizing glimpse of what life is like for non Starfleet citizens right. in the episode. Right. And, it, you know, the Federation is an anarchistic, socialist, atheist society. You know, it's a paradise of potentially trillions of beings. And I like the idea that there's at least one group that's convinced that we'd be better off if everybody, everybody put their clothes back on. <laughs> You'd have to imagine that there'd be thousands of groups or, or Facebook groups like that yeah. in the Federation. And I like that the people who don't agree with them still show up to the meeting and they listen to what they have to say. They politely disagree. And then they go looking for some Gemma Harone. You know, that's that's utopian participatory, demo- uh, part- participatory democracy to yeah. me. But the episode, you're right. Like they take the whole Wharf doesn't like fun thing, yeah. which, by the way, they lean on pretty heavily yeah. in Web Trek, the last episode of Webster, uh, <laughs> and let that have Worf go off and join these yahoos and then they're messing with the weather yeah. and he's like basically giving tips to a terrorist organization. Yeah. yeah. And at the very end of the episode, what have we learned? Nothing. Nothing. We've learned nothing at all. And Worf punches Jessica the guy out. Them? No. Like, no. And no, she stays with him. Yeah, exactly. She, she totally been like, I'm out. Like that, that is ridiculous stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you know, we have, Oh, go ahead. One of the fun, one of the most fun things about the DS9 Dominion War was them pulling so many Klingons on camera to to sing and to headbutt yeah. and to to drink in Quark's bar, and you know, and Martok is serious, but also is like, "Come on, man, we're gonna we're gonna get out there, and we're gonna kill us some Jemadar," you know, and right, right. and like that's who the, and that's who the Klingon should be, and by having Worf be this stick in the mud, I I understand. Like they have a, they have a great sort of 
it's it's kind of like the Superman cardboard speech from from Justice League, and I don't know if you know this <laughs> reference, but I do. Yeah, I feel like I live in a world made of cardboard. Exactly, yeah. it's fantastic, right? I mean, it's one of the best. Right? I think Dwayne McDuffie wrote it. It's one of the greatest sort of Superman it. scenes ever, and. And I get Worf saying, like, I grew up on Earth where if I if I let my anger go, if I if I got if I got Klingon, people got broken arms and could get really, really hurt. He tells this story about how he kills a kid in a football game. Did, did, so right, it, does, is that yeah. is that the episode where he tells it? Yep. Oh um, my god. So yeah, he tack, he tack, some kid tackles him or he tackles a kid and the kid dies and yeah. it's and then everybody shuns him and it's like what. I know, but so now they're saying like he he can't have fun because you know he he killed some kid in a football game, so you know. But you know, in in the Superman scene, it's wonderful because he gets to be like the gloves are off, buddy. Here we go. And with Worf, it's like I can never have any fun ever again. And it, you know, yeah. it it's just the payoff is so negative. Um, yeah, and what we're like I was mentioning before, like this is an emergent character. Uh, detail or property of Worf. Like, yes. I don't think that he was designed that no. way. That's something that's that's developed over time. And like you pointed out, Klingons know, have plenty of fun. Yeah. But for some, it becomes a problem that's not about Klingons. It's about Worf. What's Worf's problem? Why can't Worf have fun? Yeah. And if the show bothered to dig into that beyond it was first and 10 and, you know, beyond right. something like that, that might be interesting, but it doesn't, no, it just ends. Yeah, fine. Use the story about hurting somebody when he was a kid, but then have him working on growing past it. Have him, yeah. have him, have him, uh, you know, be in love with Jadzia because she, she is the opposite of that. And he wants to be more like that. He wants to bring that into his life. There, the way that they wrote Jadzia, who is a fun, like vibrant, character there's no way the two of them would have ended up together i just uh, like like he's such a debbie downer at every party and i just think she's the life of the party it's so weird um, yeah and if they really want to lean into their sort of enlightened ideas about sexuality i think dax is just like this is a and it's hard to gauge because how long do trills live but right. this is a midlife crisis for her yeah. or this is just her reaching sexual maturity and being like i'm gonna try dating a klingon for a while right you know, and of course, you know, we know that they end up married, but right. I can totally see her having a couple experiences like this and being like, okay, the fun's, the fun's over yeah. from this. <laughs> they're and done they're that. Done. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, no, I, I think, it, and, and what we're getting at here to, to bring it back around is that, that oftentimes I think the worst episodes, like you say, are not just the ones that are ridiculous. I mean, the, there are certainly th things like Code of Honor that are just ridiculous, but the ones that really fall flat. Like this one that wasn't mentioned with with Worf and Jadzi on Riza. It wasn't mentioned in their worst top ten. But maybe the worst ones are the ones where they don't allow the the the, the characters run up against a wall and they can't break through it because the writers won't let them. You know, and and we as fans we know that there's more to these characters. We we fans write fan fiction where they create where they let the characters go do more, and they create fan films where they let them go and do more. But for right. some reason the 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 writers handcuff their own characters and maybe yeah they maybe squander the, the potential of what they've got in yeah. the world yeah well we've got a show on this network the just enough joke network called craft to services where we talk about oh, guilty yeah. pleasure movies um do you have uh, guilty pleasure movies i should say are just films that you know are objectively bad but you like them anyway sure is there an episode that you you know is bad you'd have to confess under oh. oath that it's bad but you still like it oh gosh well uh, uh... There are a lot of people who hate the holodeck episodes, and I love them. Okay. Uh, I also love Q episodes, and I know hmm. some people, like the host of this podcast, um, are, don't, don't don't love all of those. Um, Not all of them. <laughs> yeah. I also uh, I have a soft spot for the Ferengi. Oh my gosh! Now I'm not saying I like Profit and Lace. Um, oh boy. Yeah, <clears throat> but I think things like Little Green Men and um, uh, like the, I. I, I dig them. I, I I think that the Ferengi are hilarious. Um, I I love Armin Shimmerman. Um, I, yeah. I I think that the actors who played the Ferengi were great. Um, yeah, I love whenever Wallace Shawn gets on there. Um, like I I, I so the without, I'm so bad at naming names of episodes. So that's why you were saying names of episodes, and I was like, which one is that? And then I tell me, I'm like, <laughs> right. I know exactly which one. So I'm bad at putting the names to episodes, but I'll say. I unabashedly love Q episodes. I unabashedly love Ferengi episodes. 
Um, and I know there's a lot of people, and I unabashedly love holodeck episodes. And I know there's a lot of people for whom each of those is a hot button issue. You know, um, I love Fistful of Datas, and I love, um, I lo- oh boy, I do, and I love the <laughs> Dixon Hill episode, and I love. Um, so I, I'll I'll own it. I'll just say it right now. Some of those are some of my favorites to rewatch, and I know objectively that they are not great episodes, but I love them. Boy, I, I I can go with you on most of that. I think Fistful of Datas is where I I get uh, I got to leave the train. I, but for me, Fistful of Datas is it's just clearly marking time. Like uh, Brent Spiner wanted to wear some costumes and do something besides not yeah. use contractions, and so therefore it's just oh, kind I of fanficy I, to me. It's like I well, know, let's go but into I still the love it. I love Troy. I think it's one of the a great Troy episode. Um, it is she good, gets to yeah, walk yeah. around sort of being not uptight anymore um and she gets to kid around with yeah, war. Right. it's a great alexander episode before they ruin that character like it's just i i there's yeah. so but and yet it's a holodeck malfunctions and data malfunctions episode wrapped into one you know which are two of the awfulest tropes yeah, right. of tng so i get it <laughs> I, I i i totally get why it's 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 not it's it's a bad episode you know in some ways but i also love the fun parts of it so, yeah, no, uh, so, and, and, yeah. and maybe, maybe there's a little part of me that likes how awful Threshold is and the way that you watch, a, like, when hell comes to Frogtown because it's so bad, you know, like, I pulled that, I pulled that one out for <laughs> wow, a long way that's back. that's a deep cut. Um, but, um, or Roadhouse, you know, like, you know, you know this is terrible, yeah. but you watch it because you want to, you want to hear the great bad lines or they live, you know, like, like movies that yeah. are just like, oh. But they're so good. They're they're so bad. They're good. Um, so th- there's yeah. maybe there's a maybe there's a sick part of me that thinks that threshold is so bad that it's good. I think threshold would be lucky to sit at that table, but I don't think that it's. Yeah, I, I don't I, think it's necessarily I'm, I'm out of the question. Um, not to join the ranks of uh, of guilty pleasures. Oh, sure. like my Which favorite. I know one, gets uh, put in top brain. ten lists all the time, but it is hilarious. Um, so I, I think that there are certain times when, and as you said before. Do you count an episode as bad when it knows that it's a silly premise and it goes with it? Or do you count it as bad when they were trying to be earnestly serious and it's really silly? See, now that's that's the question of the um, on the film side where is it like the room where right. they've made this unintentional comedic classic or is it um, Birdemic right. 2 where, OK, now they know the joke's up. They know that, you know, they're silly. And for me, that's the problem mm-hmm. with a lot of the comedy in DS9. I think a lot of the comedy that I enjoy in DS9 comes from interactions between very yeah. talented uh, comedic actors who are doing like a good script. Um, you mentioned the Ferengi actors. And as I've been watching DS9 recently um, for my Patreon shows, I've really come to have a great right, appreciation Rob. of uh, Max Grodenchik, um, who is as Rom, who is somebody who I didn't even think about the first time I watched the show and I see how much he's doing and how much he really brings that character to life and, and gives depth to the character. But DS nine has all these quote unquote funny episodes where it's the James Bond episode or it's the, you know, wacky episode and they're trying so hard to make you laugh. And there's nothing is less funny than somebody trying really hard to make you laugh. I still love them. (laughs) (laughs) All right. A cowboy hat for you then. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, like you mentioned before, uh, we usually have segments on this show, but this episode's so bad, we've had to invert some of them. Yeah. Instead of having a Starfleet Medal of Honor award that is your favorite scene, character, or moment, uh, what about a formal reprimand, the worst scene, character, or moment? Oh, gosh. In this episode, the worst? That's you're, yes. I, that's ooh, that's a tough challenge. Uh, Who's going to the brig for this one? Yeah. Um, the worst moment uh i mean i i think tom paris pulling his tongue out is <laughs> um is probably like a low point for all of trek i i, <laughs> I think every time that happens and i yeah. it's like how can i watch this episode so that i can say every time that happens but every time i watch that happen i am aghast again at the decision that somebody made to write like, can you imagine, like, the... And then his tongue the comes out. Jelly, like, Tom puts his hands in his mouth. He ch- makes choking sounds. He pulls on his tongue. He dislodges it with a slurping sound. <laughs> he pulls the whole thing out like it's a, like it's a tongue of, 
of, of beef or something, right. and then turns to the camera and to the other actors and smiles. That yeah. that moment for me is hands down the worst moment of this entire episode. It's grotesque. It's unnecessary. Um, it it's so bad it's not even funny. It's just like, oh my god, what am I watching? Uh, Note to prop department, get a lot of fruit roll-ups, like yeah. a lot of them. Oh, God, yeah. And, yeah. like, it, it, they just slimed it up. I mean, it is total yeah. slimy. Uh, and then you go to commercial break, and you get, you know, you, you get a two, good two or three minutes to, to think about whether or not you actually want to return for more of that. Yeah, body horror is really not on script for Star yes. Trek. I mean, it's done it They in do the it past. every now and then. They do it every yeah. now and then, but but not much. I've seen people, when talking about this episode, refer to the the dream sequence where Troy is a cake and being eaten, which is another <laughs> yeah. bar moment. Sure. Um, there's the one where the where they keep getting sucked in through to another dimension, and people are uh, aliens are doing autopsies on them. Riker's getting his arm cut off. Right. And put back right. On. I, yeah. I find that I find body um, body stuff like that very disturbing. Um, you know, they they found a way to torture Picard. In the David Warner uh, episode, the five, the four lights episode, they found a way to torture Picard without torturing Picard, you know, without physically torturing him. He he staggers in thin, and the food gets pulled away from him, and that sort of thing. They give him gross food. They too. give him gross food, right? So there is that, and and there's the 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 the, the episode that you already covered in the in, in the um, on the show here um, with the. The aliens in the back of the neck that take people over and, um, you know, and, and, and there's the Conspiracy. grotesque. What, what's it called? Conspiracy. That's it. Right. And they, cause it's, again, I don't remember titles. So the, um, I don't know what the book, my books are called. So, um, <laughs> so the, you know, they're eating the worms and stuff and they always have the gawk, you know, jokes with Klingons. They do like their gross stuff every now and then, but. But this, but it's like of, kitty gross out stuff. Yeah, that, it's that's, like ew. Yeah, that's kind of ooh. You, you, yeah, you just kind of like your skin crawls a little. This is kind of like turn away from the TV. And if you were eating dinner during uh, a, an episode of Voyager, say, where you kind of can't finish your food. I mean, it's yeah. kind of like, and and so I, I, when the episode goes off in this direction, that's that's when the warning flags start going off. Uh, you know, like around the twenty minute mark, where twenty or thirty minutes in where the, the horror show begins in sickbay. And you're just like, why? this isn't entertainment to me. It's just gross. It's disgusting. Yep. They're just trying to gross you out. That's the last refuge yeah. of somebody who doesn't have anything to say, yeah. sadly. <laughs> yeah, I do have a favorite moment. I do have, okay, that's... I, so I do have a Medal of Honor. Um, okay. And, and um, I love when... <laughs> this is a great moment. When... Um, Paris has come back from warp 10. He's not a monster yet. He's unconscious in sick bay. The doctor and Janeway are standing over him. And Janeway's like, is he okay? Is everything all right? And the doctor's like, I've scanned him. Apparently everything's okay. I'm going to still have to do some tests, but he seems to be fine. And she's like, great. Can you wake him up? He's like, sure. And he leans in and he's like, Lieutenant, wake up! Wake up! <laughs> <laughs> and Paris jumps up. Uh, that is a great moment of comedy and it's fantastic and like that, like of all all the stuff that's wrong with this episode, the writing for the doctor was spot on the entire way through. Yes. Like they had him down by this point in season two. He's making, you know, like, like he's like when, when, when Paris comes in later on and, and he can't breathe and he's having an allergic reaction and they're like, what did he eat? And they're like, yeah, he had some of Neelix's coffee. And he's like, well, that would do it. I mean, like, Right. It's a little. I mean, I know it's a little bit of a rim. Shot. You expect a rim shot there, but, <laughs> right? You know, but 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 still, the, it's those wry observations that that made him who he was. That made his bedside manner so terrible. When he when he just shouts at Paris to wake him up, yeah. Back to Janeway, and she gives this look like, really, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And not to get all comedy nerd, but it really it's it's great. That was I was that was my choice for Medal of Honor yeah. too. Um, it's it, it really works in the setting because it works with and both against the setting in that we expect him to shoot him up with some Absolutely. device, you know, or to use some kind of thing, and he just goes wake up. Yeah, the irony is is really great. Yeah, if you had told Beverly Crusher, can you wake him? She would have given. She would have pulled out a, a you know, hypo spray, put something in him, and they would have woken up gently, right? Like Beverly never would have. She wouldn't even have poked somebody to wake them up, right. you know. Not even <laughs> Bones might have poked somebody, but he wouldn't have yelled out. Well, maybe you'd yell at Spock, but, but, you know, but it's it's such a great moment of comedy that works so fine. 
Uh, I also got to say, I love at the end. <laughs> this is they're just trying to get done with the episode so fast. But when Tuvok and Chakotay come down to Dagobah and they find they find the salamander versions of Janeway and and um, and Paris, like Chakotay walks up and he doesn't even like scan it. He just shoots it. He just, just phaser him right down. Yep. He just pulls out the phaser and pssst, and it just thumps to the ground and then he does it to the other one. And I just uh, that cracks me up because it's like, um, you know, I I uh, I used to do a lot more role playing with Star Trek. I I still do D and D, but I I used to do a lot of track role playing. And I got into the habit of look, you have a you have a weapon in your hand that stuns people, right? And right. so whenever we'd walk into a new room that had potentially da- potential danger in it, I just shot everybody. I, I just was stunning everybody. And it, and my, my my co-players would be like, we're we're supposed to talk to them. I'm like, stun, stun, stun. When they wake up and we have a gun on them, then we'll talk to them. You know, and like, but but it, Chico, like it, of course I was it was a joke the way I was handling. I was handling it like a gamer, not like a like an actual Star Trek uh, officer would. But Chicote right. totally walks in and games it. He's like, I'm I'm not screwing around with this. Stun. Stun. Right. <laughs> uh, I mean, and there's some there's also some good Tuvok humor in there as well. You know, like, you know, which one do you think Jay is Janeway? And he's like, uh, the female. You know, and and then Chicote, right. like, how am I gonna write this up? And he's like, I don't know, but I look forward to reading it. You I want to read that. Yeah. So there's so there's some there's some great lines in there because they're they're the lines that laugh at at, at the situation. Or the lines that that find humor in in a situation like you said earlier on that the great comedy trick of you know you expect a doctor to wake somebody up in a more gentle way and so um, there were moments of real I, I I put in here in my notes intentional humor <laughs> because <laughs> this this episode has a whole lot of unintentional humor yeah I think you have to make that distinction yeah. uh, boy I think that we've said just about everything we can think of is there anything that you've left unsaid about this uh, horrible trash fire of an episode yeah uh, not much reset button we talked about a lot of stuff like that um, you know Braga has later on admitted that this is a stinking pile um, people it doesn't help now Brandon yeah I know right a little late <laughs> Um, but I did read something, uh, I guess from Jerry Taylor, a little bit d- defensive about this episode and, and, and maybe just to get back to, to, just to, to go out, not on, uh, uh not, not with, not, not with phasers on stun. Uh, but, um, <laughs> just to kind of say that week in and week out, it's hard to write something. I know as a writer, how hard it is to be creative, uh, on demand. And, um, mm-hmm. these, these guys were writing episodes and handing scripts to people the day they were shooting them sometimes, a lot of times. Yeah. And, um, there's a lot of, oh, there's always a lot of cooks in, in, in the kitchen and a lot of things that we don't know, as you were saying from the book about the producers of TOS and, and how they were always juggling things and how they thought they knew best and et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, every now and then you're going to have an episode like Threshold that just, that just totally misfires um and they were trying <laughs> e for effort um yeah but we we have to acknowledge that it's terrible we don't have to love it because they did it um th- there have even been fans who suggest that this should not be considered canon that this episode should be removed from canon because of the work yeah. 10 stuff and to that i always get frustrated with with uh fandom uh, w- of which i'm a part i always get frustrated though with fandom when they when they want to excise one part of of a, of a show um, because they don't like it. Um, you know, yeah. if Lucas wants to introduce midichlorians, suck it up, Buttercup. I mean, like, you may not like it. I don't like it. I think it's stupid. You know, if if they want to break warp 10 in this, suck it up. I mean, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the deal. Uh, and especially on a TV show that has, you know, there's over 700 yeah. episodes in total in the franchise – and the original series wasn't even thinking about it yep. in terms of continuity. Yep. They would just do something different every yep. week. So, yeah, you, whether you believe or not that this episode is in canon, it's not going to affect anything going forward in the Trek universe. You know, you can just enjoy whatever show it is that you watch, be it old or something new. And the existence of or non-existence of Threshold is, is not going to no, hurt you. Uh, yeah, and, and you can uh, – uh, Rick Sternbach, that, that, that weird nonsense – psycho like techno babble that i that i read he, he found a yeah. way of explaining this and and that's the thing that's so great also about about fandom 
Um, we will we will dis- we will explain away any continuity errors that you wish to throw at us. Um, you just keep bringing them. <laughs> we'll keep explaining yep. why the Klingons look different. You know, <laughs> oh, God. we'll we we'll, you know why the, why some people went faster than warp ten in TOS and they can't now. We we'll do it. Uh, yeah. So um, you know, just to give them a break. Also, uh, I forgot totally. Um, Tom Paris becomes the Time Lord, right? I mean, he gets. He gets two right. hearts. He travels in a craft that allows him to go anywhere in time and space. Tom Paris is a time lord, except that they looks, yeah. yeah. Then they irradiate him and change him back. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and his kit, his companion is unwilling. Yes. <laughs> he has oh to God. phaser her. That's like the worst Doctor <laughs> Who companion situation ever. Kidnapped, turned into a space salamander. Who are you? Or zap babies <laughs> with the doctor. Nightmare. Uh, not good. Well, last time you were on the show, you named Picard as your favorite captain. And thanks to the TNG episode Genesis, I think we know how Picard would act in a situation like yes. this. But what do you think Picard would do with the salamander babies at the end of the episode? Yeah, I actually thought about that. Um, uh, what would Picard do? Um, which I ask myself every day. Um, mm. And um, uh, he, he – we have to imagine he's in the Delta Quadrant, right? We, we, can't, we can't make this yeah. – we can't make this he radios in. Circumstances are He can't same. call in Starfleet. Sci- uh, medical to come quarantine the planet and, and start taking care of the babies, right? So there, he's right. off in the Delta Quadrant. He's the captain of Voyager. Um, he does not leave those babies behind. Um, I think he picks them up. He puts them on. The, he takes a whole cargo bay. He turns it into an environment for them. And I think he raises those babies. Sure. I, plays the uh, flute to them. Oh, yeah. Oh, comes uh, Totally. Comes in and plays his inner light <laughs> flute. You know, and... Um, and and um, probably you know like assigns Wesley to clean out their pen every now and then. Um, <laughs> no, totally. Uh, and you know makes Worf hug them. It's like like it's it's a it's a learning lesson for the whole crew. Oh, that's so much better than what we got. <laughs> and you know Picard doesn't even like children, but I think in this case, <laughs> I think in this case he makes an exception. But but amphibious children, that's a different especially story. since they're. In this scenario, they're his kids because if Janeway is the – yeah, yeah. So uh, – and maybe now he won't be so torn up when Renee dies in a fire. Oh, God. <laughs> I've, I've had enough. I've had enough. I think we need to shut it down. I can't go past that barrier, I don't think. Um, for appearing again on the show, you'll receive a promotion yeah. to the rank to the rank of lieutenant junior yeah. grade. I know you've been working in ops with an eye on command. How's that progressed? Oh, uh, it's been great. Uh, I uh, I love ops because I can get in everybody's business. But um, but I think I'm ready to move on. I think I've decided uh, that I would like to uh, to change roles to be a holodeck programmer. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Explain. Well, I would love to be the one creating the fictions that the the crew uses to relax, to to blow off steam. You know, the Battle of sure. Britain, the spy thrillers, the the Wild West scenarios. Um, I'll do. You know, the the I think it's a great way for them to to uh, to to blow off steam, but also to explore their emotions and to and to be to use it as therapy, also the like way Barclay does. So um, I would like to to be the person who's creating the things that they go in and do on their free time. Yeah. The, and also they use it, of course, for um, design uh, for oh, R&D, yeah. as they totally. do in this episode. But uh, something that always gets me is the kind of work that would go into not only creating a story, but creating a story that can be interacted in every way that you can interact right. with an environment, so- physically, everything. And I, a, a show... <laughs> This is the wrong. This is the wrong episode or the wrong show podcast. But uh, I really was looking forward to seeing Westworld because of oh, that. Yeah. Uh, and then Westworld. I don't know if you watch it or not, but it's just basically become a collection of you know mystery show tropes, right. and they don't even really get into how they construct narratives and right. what the um, like, what the hosts experience yeah, and that sort of thing. Alan. So um, yeah, so it, yeah, no, uh, we're seeing this. I think in the evolution of video games right now, and again, different podcast, but. Um, you know, my daughter's a big fan of Detroit Become Human right now, and, and I, I love the, the Walking Dead sort of story versions of the games that you can play through sure. the Telltale games. And, and I think that those kind of – or, or the immersive like sort of Skyrim games where it's an open world. One of my favorite old school games was Sid Meier's Pirates. It was one of the first games where you were yeah. just thrown into the Caribbean and you can do whatever. You want to just 
go around trading goods? Fine. You want to go rescue your sister? Cool. You want to, you know, be an enemy of the English or the Spanish? You pick. And um, I, I love that kind of game. And I think, look, if we ever had a real holodeck, it, it's game over for the human race. We're, we're, it, it's, it's worse than, than the Oasis. You know, it, it's worse than, right. than all that. We, we, if you can walk in and be yourself and interact with all that stuff, it is game over for us. Because we will all just go in. You know, I already play video games with a huge chunk of my day. I'd be living in there. And so um, yeah. to, to write one where every one of your possible choices can be, can be like you said, responded to and, and, and you can interact with the world in, a, in, a, in, a, in that way. I love it. You know, um, I love the, when, when, they, when they challenge the holodeck to, uh, to, give, to give Data a puzzle he can solve. But, we, but before we get to that, they walk in and it's putting random pieces of Sherlock Holmes stories together. And he's able right. to, because of his brain, computer brain, identify them. But a human brain, for most of us, that would be a really hard challenge. And it would be as easy as saying, take all the Holmes books, uh, stories, and and craft a Holmes-like adventure for me to play. That'd be amazing, right? It's procedurally generated. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, it, 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 I, think, I think that in the future, were we ever to have anything quite like a holodeck, um, it would be the work of a lifetime to create some of these stories um it would be Certainly. it would be uh, i think in that in that voyager episode they in that episode they call it a hollow novel that people are playing out and i love that idea i love the idea of an immersive story that that has a number of different options to it um where you can play them all out i think once we work within the oasis or a virtual environment then we're screwed. oh yeah because you can play video games all day but at some point you have to go to work so you can afford to keep the power bill you know pay the power right. bill so the game keep, continues to work but once we slot into the virtual environment to work as well then we're in right once you're making once you're once you're crafting shirts to make one gold piece per shirt uh to pay for <laughs> to pay for your electric bill it's over <laughs> that's true. Yeah, ironically, once it's not fun anymore, <laughs> right. that's when yeah. it'll go it's forever. It's the grinding. That's when, that's yeah. when that, <laughs> that, the human race will totally invent the world's best video game and then have you grind to craft stuff. That is our that is our lot. Pretty much. <laughs> well, Lieutenant Gratz, thanks for joining me to talk about Star thanks. Trek and the Star Trek I, universe. Look, I made it to Lieutenant Junior Grade faster than Ensign Kim. That's right. You are now. You can yeah suck it at Harry <laughs> Kim. <laughs> Uh, if people want to continue the conversation and they can at at EIST pod on Twitter and the enterprising individuals, Facebook page, where can people find you? on? Yeah, that? I am at uh, Alan Gratz.com. That's got all my info about my books and, and uh, what I do. And, and I also have added uh, a, a tab on my website that shows all the costumes that my family and I have created for uh, costume con like masquerades at like Dragon Con and stuff. Ooh, so if you're interested, neat. head over there and check that out. I'm also on Twitter at Alan Gratz, all one word. That's A-L-A-N-G-R-A-T-Z. And I'm also on Facebook as Alan Gratz. Awesome. And people should look out for Grenade, I mean, generally, but they should look out for your upcoming novel, Grenade. It, yeah, Bows, uh October 9th. Well, thanks again for joining me. My pleasure. And we are signing off until the next mission, Hailing Frequencies Closed. Sonora.